Government will, of course, consider all of these issues as part of the budget process um, which follows the UK spending review. Thank you, Cabinet Secretary. That concludes question time. And the next item of business is a debate on motion number 14688 in the name of Jackie Bailey on supporting Scotland's children. Could I invite those members who would like to participate in this debate to please press the request to speak buttons now. And I call on Jackie Bailey to speak to and move the motion. 14 minutes, please, Ms Bailey. Thank you very much, Presiding Officer. Today is a historic day for the Scottish Parliament and a defining day for devolution. The members of this chamber are going to look ahead to the future and lay out their plans to transform the lives of people in this country using the new powers coming to this Parliament. And I have to say, Presiding Officer, if the SNP do not support our motion today, it will confirm once and for all that the politics of grievance is more important to them than helping working families in Scotland. We have the power to make change. We have the money to pay for that change. The question is, does the SNP have the political will? Scottish politics is about to get real, and, presiding officer, it's not before time. At Scottish Labour Conference in Perth this weekend, Kezia Dugdale outlined Labour's plans to protect working families. Scottish Labour will restore, in full, the money for tax credits. Scottish Labour will make different choices on tax to the SNP government in Edinburgh and different choices to the Tory government in London. We would not implement the Tory tax cut for higher rate earners. We would not implement the SNP's tax cut on airlines. Yeah, yeah. Presiding officer, tax cuts actually cost money. You spend money to cut a tax, but we'd spend that money differently. We would use that revenue to restore the money lost for tax credits for families in Scotland, using the new powers coming to the Scottish Parliament through the Scotland Bill. Roger Fraser. I'm grateful to Jackie Bailey for giving away. Can she spell out to the Chamber how much money will be raised by the tax changes that she proposes? Jackie Bailey. I will later on in the course of the speech, but I wonder whether I could get um, Murdo Fraser to reflect on the words of um, a Tory MP, David Davis, when he said the government needs to look at this again. For three million families, losing £1,000 doesn't mean cancelling your holiday. It means an empty pantry. And I hope this doesn't turn out to be our poll tax. I wonder, in Murdo Fraser's opening, whether he would confirm whether he agrees with David Davis or not. Labour will use the new powers coming to this Parliament to fulfil its historic mission to stand up for working people. And I can promise you that no one will pay more tax than they are paying now under Labour's plans to restore the money lost from tax credits. Not one penny more. We would use the air passenger duty of £250 million to help working families rather than give a tax cut to airlines as the SNP propose. We will not increase tax thresholds for those earning over £42,000, which the Tories propose, giving funding to answer Murdo Fraser's question of £440 million. There is more than enough from both these sources to fully fund the policy and even a bit more. Now, the SNP really do need to keep up. The claim that our funding has already been committed for education is absolute nonsense. Unlike the SNP, we don't spend the same amount of money over and over and over again. As Kezia Dugdale outlined at the weekend, we will use the powers coming to Scotland to set a 50 pence top rate of tax on those earning over £150,000 a year to invest in education. Specifically, a fair start fund for our poorest pupils, an idea which was praised this week by the Commission on School Reform, which criticised a lack of urgency from the SNP on closing the attainment gap between the richest and the rest in our classrooms. So the Government amendment is factually wrong, but I don't imagine that would bother Alex Neil too much. Why let the facts stand in the way of him spinning yarns? And I fully expect from him a pantomime dame performance to distract us from the paucity of the SNP's position. Now, the SNP motion says that we don't have the power. Well, what rubbish. John Swinney says we don't have the money, but I've just demonstrated that we do. This is about political will. Alex Neil has over 5,000 families in his constituency who
who are in receipt of tax credits. Today, he has turned his back on them, offering them a pitiful excuse rather than real action. He is putting grudge and grievance with the UK before action that will help working families. And he's using... He's using the Constitution as a distraction and simply an excuse. Like the SNP government, like the SNP government, Alex Neil is very, very good at talking, but not so good at doing. It was just last Sunday, because he knows I hang on his every word, that he said tax credits can be a lifeline for families on low incomes that rely on them to get through daily life, put food on the table, heat their home and pay their bills. Well, you know, I agree. He said removing this vital support from thousands of families will widen the gap in inequalities and push even more people into poverty. Well, I agree with that too. And he said the UK government's plans are a clear attack on low-income working families and those families must be protected as a matter of urgency. Presiding officer Alex Neil can claim the match ball. That's a hat trick of things I agree with him about. Both Alex Neil and I oppose Tory austerity. The difference between us is that I am willing to do something about it, not simply wring my hands, tell everybody how bad it is. Let's take action. Let's okay. see the possibilities, if Alex Neil listens, let's see the possibilities of devolution and use the power to do good. I am willing to unlock the potential of devolution and use the powers of this parliament for the purpose of standing up for working class families. The SNP, in a second, the SNP want to hide behind the constitution. Stronger for Scotland, not for working families, the SNP aren't. Yeah. The first minister said she wanted the motto of our country to be can do Scotland. I agree with that too. It's just a pity she leads a can't-do government. Yep. Happy to give Kevin way. Kevin Stewart. Um, I thank Ms Bailey for giving way. Uh, in 2013, Ms Bailey said, I'm not saying that you know we can't develop our own welfare system. I'm saying we shouldn't develop our own welfare system. What has changed her mind, and why doesn't she want all of the welfare powers devolved to this Jackie parliament? Jackie Bailey. Audrey, please. Jackie this Bailey. Is so typical of the SNP to hark back to the past, you know. Um, 55, Audrey, 55 is greater than 45. You didn't win the referendum. The people of Scotland settled will is to have a partnership with the UK government. <laughs> Let me talk about tax credits. Audrey, please. Let me talk about tax credits. Check me on the front officer. bench. Because tax credits work. They boosted people's earnings in a targeted way to really tackle inequality. They lifted hundreds of thousands of children out of poverty. They allow families to aspire to more than just making it to the end of the month or the end of the week. David Cameron has broken his promise not to cut tax credits. And it is working families who are paying the price. In Scotland, nearly 350,000 families rely on the money from tax credits, with the average family being more than £100 a month worse off as a result of the cuts planned by the Tories. This is a tax rise on the working poor. 70% of the money saved by this tax rise on working people will come from the pockets of working mothers. In a few weeks just before Christmas, families were due to receive letters on their doormats telling them how much they're going to lose. What a cruel way to break a promise. But can I say, and I never thought I would say this, thank God for the House of Lords. Labour, working alongside crossbenchers, led the defeat of the Chancellor's plans in the House of Lords, and he has been forced to think again. We must keep the pressure on the Tories to cancel their plans, to cut tax credits, but if they ultimately refuse, we will stand up for Scottish families, come what may. Because it wasn't just the Tories who made a promise to the people of Scotland. Both Labour and the SNP promised working families a break from Tory austerity. And it's why we should use the new powers coming to the Parliament to restore the money lost from tax credits for working families in Scotland. Few members of this chamber could have been as vocal about this Parliament taking on more financial responsibility than the leader of the Scottish Conservatives. 
and I have no doubt in my mind that the Tories will probably run on a ticket of tax cuts for next year. But they cannot, as they appear to want to do, claim to be caring or compassionate Conservatives if they let George Osborne cut tax credits for working families. Now, if Ruth Davidson does not intervene to stop this, then she and her party will stand accused of introducing a measure which is even worse than the poll tax in Scotland. Anything short of that and the mask slips. And we'll know that compassionate conservatism is simply a sham. Presiding officer, we have of course been here before. The Tories make a cruel decision at Westminster, the Scottish Tories look awkwardly at their shoes, and the SNP do anything at all to avoid taking responsibility. That, of course, was the bedroom tax, mentioned by the SNP in their own amendment. For months, the SNP said protecting vulnerable Scots from the bedroom tax just couldn't be done, despite Scottish Labour saying repeatedly that it could. We had the money then, we had the power then, but the SNP didn't have the political will to do anything about it. Vulnerable people had to wait a year for action by the SNP. John Swinney, where's he gone? John Swinney has elected not to speak in a debate this afternoon about tax choices that this government faces today. He eventually admitted he could mitigate the impact of the bedroom tax, but he didn't want to do it because it would, and I quote, let Westminster off the hook. Well, what a shameful thing to say when you claim to be anti-austerity. The reality is, the SNP set up constitutional excuses to avoid blocking the bedroom tax for as long as they possibly could. They had to be dragged, kicking and screaming, into this chamber to a decision by Scottish Labour. Yep. It is shameful, shameful that they're attempting to play the same red herring yet again. But they should be careful because people saw through it the first time, they will see through you again. The SNP government are trying to claim that we cannot do this, that we cannot protect working families. But let me tell you, we can. They're trying to claim that the new powers coming to Scotland will not allow us to make fairer choices on tax credits. But let me tell you, they will. Clause 21, how? Well, listen. Clause 21 of the Scotland Bill gives us the power to do it. And let me quote from the Scotland office. Holyrood will be able to top up payments to people in Scotland who are entitled to a reserve benefit. These payments will be in addition to the reserve benefits and will allow the Scottish Government to provide extra money to people on reserve benefits where they consider it necessary. The independent experts at the Scottish Parliament Information Centre agree that there is the power to top up tax credits. And so do the independent experts at the House of Commons Library. Fiona MacLeod. MacLeod. Um, can, Ms Bailey, are you not aware that the top up and reserve benefits is only in case of severe hardship? And if someone... If... If... Order, if please. someone has had their benefit taken no. off them, you can no longer I'll top give you it time up. Back. Jackie Bailey. Thank you, Presiding Officer. What, what, what is fascinating is that the member clearly doesn't understand the detail that's there. How many times? How many times? Order, please. Does she need to be told? The UK government say we can top up. Spice say we can top up. The independent experts at the House of Commons Library say we can top up. Now, let, let's just talk about independence for a minute, because I, I, know, do, please. I know you're keen to do so, because it was just over a year ago that the SNP tried to claim that an independent Scotland the could share the conclusion. administration of welfare with the rest of the UK. Now they're trying to claim that a devolved Scotland with powers over tax and welfare cannot restore the money for tax credits. How absurd is yeah. that? A party of government who claimed that after independence they could run a different welfare system yeah. using the UK system now pretends it's impossible yeah. to run a different system inside the UK, even with the UK government offering to do just that. 
Alex Neil should be embarrassed to be peddling that nonsense. He should be especially embarrassed as he's doing it to avoid protecting working families. Presiding officer, politics is about priorities. It is about values. Joe Biden said, don't tell me what you value, show me your budget and I'll tell you what you value. So rather than hide behind the constitution, rather than peddle the familiar politics of grudge and grievance, the SNP should try something new. Maybe they should show us the money. Just tell us what's more important to him, his party and his government. The incomes of working class families or the price of a business class flight. Presiding officer, the SNP have the power, they have the money, but do they have the political will? I am proud to move the motion in my name. Many thanks. And I now call on Alex Neil to speak to and move Amendment 14688.3. Cabinet Secretary, 10 minutes, please. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Presiding Officer, last night, Jackie Bailey voted with the Tories to spend £167 billion replacing Trident and building a new generation of weapons of mass destruction. I find it incredible that less than 24 hours later, she's still leading for Labour as a spokesperson on public services. <laughs> Presiding officer, how can Labour have any credibility on public services when their cheerleader in this debate votes to spend £167 billion on warfare instead of welfare. Now, to, be fair, to be fair to Jackie Bailey, and I'm always fair to Jackie Bailey, her colleagues in London also failed to oppose the Tories' welfare reform bill. Indeed, the then acting leader of the Labour Party, Harriet Harman, wanted to vote for the Tory bill. At the end of the day, they eventually agreed to merely abstain. But at no point did I hear Jackie Bailey criticise Harriet Harman for wanting to vote for this Tory bill. Jackie Bailey herself, no, Jackie Bailey herself made it clear during the referendum Order, that she, please. Jackie Bailey herself made it clear during the referendum that she was opposed Mr. to social Debbie, security order. powers coming to this parliament. Presiding officer, had Jackie Bailey... Order, please. Presiding officer, had Jackie Bailey had her way and no powers be coming to this parliament, we would not now be getting the power to reverse the Tory could Cabinet tax Secretary, credit. could you sit down, please? I have a point of order from Rhoda Grant. Can I ask the presiding officer's guidance? I thought that it was in order that a member spoke to the debate and not the debate of the previous day. Thank you, Ms Grant. The Cabinet Secretary is opening the debate with debate and points. He's speaking about welfare and it's entirely up to me whether I stop the Cabinet Secretary or not. Cabinet Secretary, could you continue now to talk to the debate? Right, presiding officer, they don't like the truth. Yeah. Uh, the... Uh, if, if, we, if, we had listened, if we had listened to Jackie Bailey and social security powers were to be denied to this parliament, we wouldn't be in the position we're in now to undo the dirty work of the Tories on some tax, tax credits. No wonder the Scottish Labour Party Order, has no credibility Order. when it comes to fighting the Tory cuts. Unlike the Labour Party, the SNP has fought the welfare cuts tooth and nail at every opportunity while they try to get into bed with the Tories. And unlike, unlike the Labour Cabinet Party... Cabinet Secretary, could you address your remarks through the chair, please? I, Thank I am you. doing so. Unlike the Labour Party, we will not run up the white flag while there's still a realistic chance of forcing the Tory Chancellor to drastically amend his proposals for tax credit cuts in the autumn statements. Because these cuts will do enormous damage to the living standards of some of the poorest working people in Britain today. In Scotland, we estimate that the impact of the proposed changes 
will be that 250,000 working households will lose tax credits on an average of £1,500 a year just from the changes that are to be brought in in April next year. In the longer term, if the full set of cuts is implemented, low-income households with children could lose an average of £3,000 a year. And that is against a backdrop of a cumulative total of £6 billion Ms. Lamont, the cabinet lost not to the intervention. Scottish Social Security budget through previous cuts. This year alone, there will be cuts of just under £2.5 billion in Scotland. Unlike Labour, presiding officer, the SNP will continue to demand further amendments to the Scotland Bill to give the Scottish Parliament power over all tax credits policy. And I hope that Labour members won't listen to Jackie Bailey again, but will agree that it's too dangerous to leave tax credits under the control of the Tories at Westminster. <laughs> Labour, Labour has to give a clear commitment to support the SNP's amendments to the Scotland Bill to ensure that the Scottish Parliament gets the power to do what Labour says it wants to do. If Labour doesn't support these amendments, it will have no credibility in relation to tax credit policy. Although, presiding officer, I also welcome the new amendments to tabled today by the UK government, which goes much closer towards what we had asked for in terms of the powers that are required. Uh, the, as Spice confirmed, until today, until this new amendment, which Jackie Bailey didn't know order, about clearly, please. until this new amendment was placed on the order paper in the House of Commons, the reality was we would not have had the power to do all of what Labour is presiding. Presiding officer, you wouldn't take an Ms. Bailey. Presiding officer, three weeks from order, today... Order, Ms Bailey. The Cabinet said she's not taking today, an intervention. I wouldn't be drowned out by them, presiding officer. <laughs> three weeks from today... We will find out if George Osborne, I will in a minute, is going to revise or refine his tax credit proposals when he makes his spending review statement in the House of Commons. The SNP will continue to demand the total reversal of the tax credit cuts in the autumn statement. But if the Tories continue to force through changes which are to the detriment of hard-pressed working families in Scotland, the Scottish Government will not stand by idly and watch the living standards of our poorest families fall off a cliff. Once we know the facts, once we know the shape and the content of what the Chancellor's final tax credit proposals look like, we will then consider carefully what action needs to be taken to protect the living standards of our most vulnerable children and Arden, families. Please. Presiding officer, we will give urgent, serious consideration to what the consequences are for the people of Scotland arising from the Chancellor's statement on the 25th of November. We will look at what corrective action needs to be taken on tax credits, when such action needs to be taken, how it should be funded and how it should be administered. And I'll now Order, take the intervention from Mr Fraser. I'm, I'm very grateful to the Cabinet Secretary for giving way. It was simply in relation to the point he made just a, a moment or two ago. Can you just confirm his understanding of the Scotland Bill uh, as amended, assuming these new amendments he refers to go through? That will give this Parliament the power, if it chooses, to replace in full any reduction in these tax credits he's referring to. Alec Neil. The, the, uh, the amendments, the amendments, tabled, the amendments tabled today should give the Scottish Parliament those powers. But until today, none of the amendments that have been tabled would have given us that power. Ms Bailey. Uh, and that Ms. Bailey. is confirmed by various people, including the great John McTernan from the Labour Party. Presiding officer, we will properly address the needs of people uh, affected by cuts in tax credits. Uh, we will look at the issue of new claimants Labour hasn't. We'll look at the time gap between the implementation of any tax credit changes and the date from which this Parliament will have the power to fill the gaps Labour hasn't. 
For example, the policy levers referred to by Labour will not be devolved to us till next year. Power to set the higher rate threshold for income tax will only come to this Parliament from April 2017 at the earliest, and responsibility for air passenger duty will not be devolved until 2018. Labour haven't done their homework. They have tried to work this out on the back of a postage stamp. Presiding officer, as a serious government, we will do the job properly. We will establish the most effective way to administer any top-ups to tax credits. We will properly cost our proposals before we bring them before this parliament. We will identify where any additional funding will come from. Unlike Labour, we won't draw up our proposals on a whim without proper research and consideration. We will make sure we get this right for the people of Scotland. We'll continue to fight against the Tory Order tax credit the cabinet cuts secretary conclude, and, please. and other unfair cuts in social security benefits, unlike many in the Labour Party and unlike Labour, we will deliver on this issue for the people of Scotland. Presiding officer, I beg to move the amendment to the motion in my name. Thank you, Cabinet Secretary. I now call in Marjo Fraser to speak to and move amendments 14688.1. Mr Fraser, six minutes. Uh, thank you, uh, Presiding Officer. C can I start the debate by warmly welcoming uh, the return of Jackie Bailey to the Labour front bench? As Jackie Bailey knows, uh, I am very fond of her, and I was more than a little concerned yesterday at her future career prospects, given her unaccustomed role, uh, banished to the back benches, and I feared she had gone from her normal position of a loyal front bench stalwart to that of a rebel backbencher. Fortunately, the true Scottish Labour leader, Mr Finlay, has hauled her back into line, <laughs> and now we see her restored to her rightful place. Long may she reign on the Labour front bench and have the good sense to continue to vote with the Conservatives. Now, residing officer, on Saturday, it was Halloween. As I took my children guising around the streets of Perth, they were terrified by the endless procession of hideous, misshapen creatures from the underworld, ghastly ghouls and the undead stalking the streets. I'm sure it was only a coincidence that the Scottish Labour Party conference was being held in our city just at that time. But what we saw at the weekend was the zombie figure of 1970s style socialism, which we had all thought had long since been consigned to its grave, hauling itself back from the earth and coming back to strike fear and alarm into the people's hearts. And today we see the first fruits of the decisions taken at the weekend at that conference, the announcements made under the new Corbynite Labour Party. And today we see the Scottish Labour Party taking a step back in history to a time of tax and spend economics, to a time of higher taxes clobbering working families. Now let me deal with the tax credits issue and try and respond to some of the points that Jackie Bailey made. We've been very clear in this party. We want to move Britain from a high welfare, high tax, low wage economy to a lower welfare, lower tax, higher wage one. And the reality is that under Labour, the tax credit bill was allowed to spiral out of control. The cost trebled in real terms in 10 years, from a system costing £4 billion in its first full year to £30 billion in 2015. And under Labour, 9 out of 10 working families with children were eligible for tax credits, including a number of members of Parliament, who by no definition could be described as poor. The whole thing had become an absurd extension of the welfare system. And don't take my word for that. Even the former Labour Chancellor, Alastair Darling, said that tax credits were, and I quote, subsidising lower wages in a way that was never intended. So the changes being introduced by the current Conservative government, coupled with, with I'll give away in a second, coupled with the introduction of the national living wage and record increases in the income tax personal allowance, mean that eight out of 10 working households will be better off in 2017-18 by an average of 130 pounds. I'll happily give way to, to the member. Joanne Lamont. Um, 
I don't accept your premise in relation to tax credits, but even if you did, can you explain to me why, in this period of transition over to high-wage, low-welfare uh, economy, it's the poorest families in our communities that have to suffer right now? Martin Fraser. Well, let, me, let, me, let me respond directly to that point, and, and the same challenge was made by, by Jackie Bailey. And we do accept there is an issue where the transition as a national living wage kicks in. That's exactly the point that Ruth Davidson raised some weeks ago. She raised it in public. She also raised it uh, in political cabinet on a number of occasions. It was an issue raised by other people in the Conservative Party, among them the leader of the Welsh Conservative Party, the Mayor of London raised it, and a number of Conservative backbenchers Jackie Bailey uh, referred to. And we look forward to the autumn statement and hearing from the Chancellor how he will address these concerns, many of which we share. But today we see Labour's solution which is to propose a hike in taxes uniquely for people no, I need to make some progress uniquely for people in Scotland to put us at a competitive disadvantage in relation to the rest of the United Kingdom. Mm -hmm. So we see Labour planning to reintroduce a 50% top rate of tax, but in Scotland only. And how much would this money raise? Not even Kezia Dugdale seems to know the answer to that question. Because according to that august publication, Holyrood Magazine, she told the editor, Mandy Rhodes, that this would raise, and I quote, up to £100 million. But bluntly, Mandy, it could also raise zero. So there we have... Yes, well, maybe Jackie Bailey can tell us. Her leader doesn't seem to know. Jackie Bailey. Um, uh, she does, actually, and we were encouraged, as I hope you will be, by HMRC's comments about pursuing those high earners who might, through behavioural change, seek to pay their taxes elsewhere. The estimated haul from that rise would be £80 million to £100 million, and I hope he will take that. But might I ask him whether he agrees with the Institute of Fiscal Studies' comments um, about the national minimum Hurry up, wage? Please, Ms. Bailey. The key fact is that the increase in the minimum wage simply cannot provide Bailey, full compensation up, for the majority of losses that will be experienced by tax credit recipients. This is just arith arithmetically impossible. Murdo Does he Fraser, agree? I'll give you a minute back. Thank you. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. Well, can I suggest to Jackie Bailey, she reads the article in Hollywood magazine I referred to, where her leader said she didn't know how much money would be raised. And it just makes clear the level of Labour's economic literacy proposing a measure that might well raise nothing to help pay for their spending commitments by their leader's own admission. Order, please. Now, there are only 14,000 higher-rate taxpayers in Scotland. Many of these 14,000 people operate businesses on a cross-border basis, and the impact of an additional 5% hike in their tax will be enough to send a large proportion south of the border, leaving us as Kezia Dugdale herself is prepared to admit, potentially with zero. But it could actually be worse than that, because we could actually end up raising less money by losing all of the revenue from these high earners if they relocate elsewhere. Once again, Labour are true to form, completely clueless when it comes to understanding taxation and how these issues should be approached. But at least to give Labour credit, they are setting out their stall. They realise that this Parliament is at last getting new powers over tax, and over welfare. They are setting out how they, as an old-style socialist party, will use these powers to hike taxes to increase public spending. Now, I believe they are fundamentally wrong in doing that. I believe they will put Scotland at a serious competitive disadvantage. But at least they are making the case. We now need to hear from the SNP what they are going to do. Will they stand with the Labour Party in Scotland, hiking taxes in the knowledge that this will reduce the tax take and leave public services in Scotland shortchanged? Or will they stand with us in resisting any further tax rises, looking to create a more competitive Scotland which welcomes entrepreneurs and seeks to grow businesses and grow personal Draw wealth? To a close, please, I listened please. carefully to what the Cabinet Secretary had to say. He used the words, I will consider carefully. He used the words, this needs urgent, serious consideration. He cannot hide for much longer. Deputy Presiding Officer. Sooner or later we will know the answers. We will know on which side they stand. I have pleasure in moving the amendment in my name. Many thanks. And to now call on Willie Rennie to speak to and move amendment 14688.2. Point of order, James Kelly. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. Uh, as, Deputy Presiding Officer as to the competency of the SNP amendment, uh, specifically the section that states there is currently no proposed power in the Scotland Bill that would enable the Scottish Government to restore all tax credits. Given that, given that during his contribution 
Mr Neil acknowledged that the bill would have the power to restore tax credits. Can I ask Deputy Presiding Order Officer till hear, if, Mr. This Kelly, motion, please. if this motion is still competent, or this amendment is still competent to be considered at decision time tonight? Thank you, Mr Kelly. I'll check that point and come back to the Chamber. I now call on Willie Rennie to speak to and move Amendment 14688.2. Six minutes, please, Mr Rennie. Deputy President Officer, I move the amendment in my name. The Labour Party, I think, is to be congratulated for taking this initiative today. A real debate about powers this Parliament is going to have. A refreshing change, something I welcome and I would have thought the SNP would welcome as well. What is disappointing is the SNP's response. A groundhog debate over powers. Faced with a choice of taking action to help low-paid workers or continuing their constitutional obsession, the SNP simply cannot help themselves. So much for accepting the result of the referendum. But I'm not in the slightest bit surprised that the SNP aren't going to back up Labour today. I'm just surprised that Labour are surprised. The SNP have got a track record on this kind of area. If you look back to the white paper, the independence white paper, you'll all remember that John Swinney's plans for the welfare budget in the first year of independence would match exactly the spending by Ian Duncan Smith. Not one penny more. They spent years arguing, debating, condemning the Westminster government for the two and a half billion pound cut to the welfare spending. But yet when it came to the fact, when it came to the opportunity None of these people on these benches condemn John Swinney for not including that extra finance in the white paper. So we've got a track record. They often complain, but when it comes to the action, when they move away from the rhetoric, they refuse to act. I felt sorry for Alex Neil today. He's often sent out. I know being felt sorry by a Liberal Democrat, that must be painful for Alec Neil. But he's sent out to deliver stirring rhetoric to lambast the opposition, to pump up the ever-loyal backbenchers. But in the most confused and contradictory speech I've heard from Alex Neil is the one that I heard today. He started off his contribution today by saying, we do not have the powers, and I demand this chamber has the powers so we can make that decision. By the end of the speech, he had conceded we had the powers after all and that he might actually take action. The most confused and contradictory contribution from a man who I hold in very high regard. But we should not forget that we are here today because of my former colleagues in the previous coalition in the Conservative Party. These ideologically driven cuts will directly affect 250,000 Scottish families and 300,000 children. I mean, Alex Neil is right about the financial impact that it will have on those families. A thousand pounds, a thousand pounds plus, with an MSP's salary, probably we can cope with. But for a family living on the breadline, finding it really difficult to make ends meet, that is a lifeline. And that is something that I deeply regret that the Conservatives continue to argue for. Because despite the warm words, from the leader of the Scottish Conservatives. The words of their amendment today wed them completely to the tax credit cuts. Actually, Murdo Fraser finished off his contribution by refusing to even consider making up the difference on the tax credits when we have the powers here. He's not prepared to make the difference when we have the power, not just now, when we have the power right here and right now. So we know where the Conservatives stand. In fact, they sent Annabel Goldie down to the House of Lords to, to vote for the tax credit cuts. The, David Mundell, he voted for them, member of the Cabinet, he voted for them in the House of Commons. And today, the Conservative MSPs are going to vote for the tax credit cuts as well. We just heard it from Murdo Fraser. Look, we, we spent many years in the coalition cutting taxes for those in lower middle incomes. The, in, the incentive was to make work pay so that people would be incentivised into work. We didn't do all that work over five years for the Conservatives to undo that work in just one year with a £1,000 plus cut to people 
on low incomes. That is not something that we wanted to see, and I think that's something that many people will condemn them for. I want to move towards a low taxation, high wages, and in the meantime, a tax credit regime to support families in need. So despite the rhetoric, we know exactly where the Conservatives stand today. Who would have believed that the House of Lords, that age-old institution, the unelected institution that I wanted to get rid of, would be more representative of, this, of the British people than the newly elected government? Who would have believed that would ever have happened? But they spoke up for working people. The new champions for working people are in the House of Lords, not within the Conservative Party. And that shows you what a topsy-turvy world we now live in. So I can say completely, we will be voting against the SNP amendment today. That is easy, because we've got the powers, and if we choose, we should be able to act on it to help working people. But I would urge, urge the Conservatives, if they have any influence over the Cabinet at Westminster, and so far they've shown they have no influence, but if they have any influence over the Conservative Cabinet, they should be sending the message out from today that these tax credit cuts should be reversed. That is the priority. That is the message. That is what we need to change. Thank you very much. Many thanks. We now turn to the open debate. I'm afraid some time has been lost this afternoon with uh, points of order and other issues. So, speeches of six minutes and members must keep to their six minutes. And I call Mark MacDonald to be followed by Malcolm Chisholm. Thank you very much, presiding officer. I think that what we have to distinguish, I think, is between principle and practicality. And I don't think the principle of supporting and assisting the most vulnerable in our society is at question here. And I think we've seen the Scottish Government take steps in those directions. The question has always been around practicality and effect. Now, the amendment that has been laid today um, and prior to today, the, I don't think anybody had had any sight of that amendment, although perhaps others did, um, will perhaps give the ability to do what the Labour Party uh, is suggesting. But the spice paper which Jackie Bailey quotes contains two important caveats. The first caveat is it first of all states if tax credits are accepted as a benefit. And at the moment, tax credits are administered through HMRC, not DWP. So there would need to be a discussion had around whether those would then be able to be classified as a benefit within the terms of the devolution settlement. But if the amendment that is put forward today allows for that to happen, we can take that as read. But the second important caveat, and I think this is a very critical one, is that top up of benefit is only possible where benefit is being received. And in the changes that are being proposed by the Chancellor of the Exchequer, a significant number of people will lose all entitlement to tax credits. They will not receive any tax credit whatsoever. And the, the question mark there is whether you could use a top-up power. Well, you couldn't use a top-up power to top up a non-existent benefit. The question therein arises, how then do you administer a system which enables those people who do not receive tax credits as a result of a change in 2016 to subsequently receive them? And given that the powers that are being proposed in the Scotland Bill are, like, are, are at the very earliest going to come into play in 2017, possibly 2018, possibly later, depending on the technicalities of disaggregating some of the functions, particularly in areas of shared competence. That leaves a significant gap in terms of time for those families, those individuals who are going to lose out. So I think the Cabinet Secretary is entirely correct when he says that the important thing here is to look very carefully at the detail and then look at the possibilities that arise as a result of that. Because first of all, we don't yet know the final picture. We don't yet know finally what the Chancellor of the Exchequer is going to propose. He has been given a bloody nose by the House of Lords, and I'm no fan of the House of Lords, but I welcome the decision they took. It doesn't make me uh, think, that, uh, think any less that the place should be abolished because it is a democratic and constitutional anachronism. But, you know, a stopped clock is right at least twice a day, so uh, there's no reason why the House of Lords can't occasionally get a decision right either. But he has been sent home to think again by the House of Lords. If I could just articulate this point, and, and then I'll come back to the member. He has been sent home to think again. So the question is then, what comes back? And what I want to ensure, and what we as a, as a party are trying to ensure, is that all guns are blazing in terms of trying to make sure that that decision 
is reversed uh, by the Chancellor of the Exchequer and that we can convince enough rebels to back the opposition on that. And what I would, want very, what, what I would hope very clearly for is that the Labour Party will be absolutely 100% opposing that in Westminster alongside the SNP and hopefully attracting rebels in order to ensure that we don't have to look further at this matter. But I'll take the member's point. Joanne Lamott. Um, what I take from what the member is saying is it's now an issue of timing. And then, of course, on this side, we want to do everything we can to stop these cuts going through. But would it not be reasonable to ask the Scottish Government, with all the power that it has, all the support that it has, to interrogate every option open to them in order to protect people, rather than spending the last few days explaining to everybody how they can't do anything to support these families? Mark MacDonald. But the, the, the Cabinet Secretary, I think, stated quite clearly in his speech that that is exactly what the government is doing and what the government will do is to look at what it can, uh, is to look at what it can do and how it can deliver uh, support for the most vulnerable. The next point is around the, the vehicle for delivery. And the vehicle for delivery is important. In order to uh, offset the bedroom tax, we were able to use discretionary housing payments. It required permissions in terms of the lifting of the cap in order for it to be able to be done, and that required negotiation with Westminster. In terms of council tax benefit, of course, we had to create a mechanism to ensure that the 10% reduction could be replaced uh, in order to fully fund council tax reduction uh, with the monies that were given to us. So again, there had to be some creative thinking applied in order to enable that to happen. But we took evidence at the Finance Committee last week from HMRC around the Scottish Rate of Income Tax. And what HMRC said was that if the Scottish Rate of Income Tax were set differently as opposed to a UK level, it would more than double the administration costs that HMRC would incur. Now, if we are to uh, be looking at the possibility of establishing a different approach in Scotland, and given that HMR, the, the, the current, there is a cost per transaction in terms of tax credits, as opposed to a global administrative sum, which there is for Scottish Rate of Income Tax, that then begs a question of where the administration costs for that will fall, and whether those are factored into the calculations which were laid out by Jackie Bailey. But the, you know, nobody, nobody here shies away from or doesn't recognise the reality of the impact on the vulnerable in society. But our record, whether it's on the establishment of the welfare fund, whether it's on council tax reduction, whether it's on housing, uh, the, house, the, the discretionary housing payments, shows that where we can, we do take action to support the most vulnerable in society. But devolution is supposed to be about our priorities and setting our own policy agenda. It shouldn't be about a case of continually being handed a, a pig's ear by Westminster and being expected on limited resources to fashion it into a silk purse. Thank you very much. I now call Malcolm Chisholm to be followed by Claire Adamson. For my speech uh, dispelling Tory myths about tax credits and the second part exposing uh, SNP myth myths about why nothing can be done. Uh, tax credits, of course, are one of the great achievements of the last uh, Labour government. A substantial reform, the IFS said in 2003, the distributional impact of which, and I quote from, the, uh, from 2003, is fully in keeping with that of past Labour reforms with the largest gains going to the poorest families. And of course, the tragic fact of the matter is that the families with the highest losses as a proportion of income now are precisely those poorest families as the threshold for reduction plunges from £6,420 to £3,850 and the taper increases from 41% to 48%. And that applies to child tax credits as well, the threshold and the taper, completely against what David Cameron promised during the general election campaign. So 43%, and we should all reflect on this fact, 43% of in-work recipients of tax credits are in households that earn less than 10 thousand pounds a year and they will lose on average more than one thousand pounds and what are appallingly regressive cuts now the rising of the income tax threshold that Murdo Fraser mentioned is irrelevant to those families they're nowhere near the income tax threshold but reflect also on the national living wage which is always invoked by the conservatives and others in this context even under the better case scenario uh, the Institute of Fiscal Studies I'm quoting again say that would uh, result in £140 extra a year, offsetting, crucially, Institute of Fiscal Studies, 11% of the tax credit losses. So this is well... Uh, I give way to Liz Smith. Liz Smith. I, I thank the member for giving way. 
Uh, would you agree with uh, Alistair Darling when he says that the uh, Labour policy on tax credit expanded to such an extent that it put intense pressure on public spending and therefore had a detrimental effect on economic growth? Malcolm well, Chisholm. The, uh, the fact of the matter is that uh, the, there, were, there, were, there are less people on tax credits now than there were under the Labour government. I accept that, but Murder Luke Fraser should have acknowledged that. There are now, all, at this moment of time before the cuts, less than 50% of working families uh, on tax credits. So in a kind of way, I think uh, we've already moved on from Alistair Darling's quote from a few years ago. I think Torsten Bell of the, Revolution, sorry, the Resolution Foundation uh, sums this up perfectly when he says tax cuts and the living wage cannot compensate for these tax credit changes. They are not an option. The answer to tax credits is tax credits. And of course, we also have the massive work disincentive in these changes, the withdrawal rate of 80 pence in the pound for any extra money earned, and in fact, 93 pence in the pound if you're on housing benefit. So what are we to do uh, uh, if there is no change from the UK government? Judith Patterson of the Child Poverty Action Group uh, at the Devolution More Powers Committee, I think two or three weeks ago, said this, the question to be asked is what will happen if Scotland does not use the power to top up tax credit? It has been forecast that if it do does not do that, many more children and families will fall into poverty over the next few years, which would have associated impacts on children's health, education and prospects. So as we all know, although some of us forget, not me personally, uh, politics is about choices. And we today are making it clear that we are making a different choice from the SNP, certainly in relation to tax on APD, and a different choice from the Conservatives in relation to the higher rate tax threshold. That may be a different choice from the SNP. They haven't told us. I give way. Bruce Crawford. Welcome, Chisholm. Sincerity in this, and I recognise what he says about choices. But I just wonder, in coming to that decision, did Labour take into account the administration costs the DWP will charge? Because, as you'll know, being on the Further Devolution Committee, that they are entitled to do that in the bill. And if so, what did you estimate? Well, our costings are, 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 are in excess of what is required in order to uh, re restore uh, the tax credits. And we have made a choice, and we will always make choices, that lead to improvements for working families and a more equal society. And we should remember that that choice involves no extra tax increases. It just means uh, a different choice from other parties about tax reduction. The motion from the SNP government says it can't be done. Wrong. The motion from the SNP government says that the money has already been earmarked for education. Wrong. The SNP motion is all over the place today. It then goes on to say that more powers are required, hiding behind the Constitution as usual, but these changes can be done with the powers that we are going to get. And if Alec Neil didn't know yesterday when he put forward the amendment that these powers were coming to Scotland, he should have done, because we certainly knew. The SNP is thrashing about, looking for excuses not to do what is self-evidently just, fair, achievable and necessary. Trying to be all things to all people, which is the SNP's way, may be a good strategy for trying to build up support in a referendum. I'll take an intervention. Alec Neil. For, can I thank the member for taking an intervention? Can I ask him, as things stand, these tax credit cuts would take effect next April, but we don't get the income tax powers till at least the following year, or the APD powers until the year after that. So when, when, what is the start date for implementation of your proposals. You have Simple to be brief, start, please, please, Mr. Chisholm. Chisholm. It's interesting, you're, you're thinking up of One at a time, Mr Chisholm. Uh, you, it's interesting that the, the government is thinking up new arguments which it obviously yeah, hadn't thought about in its, in, its, in, its, in, its, in its motion in its motion today. My last, my close, last please, word, Mr. my last Chisholm. word, my last word. They may think it's a good strategy for building up support for a referendum being all things to all people, but it is a useless strategy for creating a, for a fairer and more equal society. And for some of us, that is the purpose of politics. Many thanks. Now call on Claire Adamson to be followed by Stuart Macmillan. Up to six minutes, please. Thank you, Presiding Officer. I think Mr Fraser earlier in the debate today talked about zombie figures, but I'm afraid we are here today and are discussing this issue purely because of the outdated dinosaur politics of the Tory party and a discredited zombie ideology that fails to learn the lessons of the global financial crisis and continues to wage war on the poor, 
increase inequality and in so doing damages the economy that they claim to care so much about. And Mr Fraser doesn't need to take my word for it, perhaps he'll take the words of Standards and Poor's in 2014. They warned that the growing income inequality in the United States was, States was slowing growth in the world's biggest economy. Aside from extreme economic swings such as income imbalances that tend to dampen social mobility and produce less educated workforce that can't compete in global economies, it diminishes future income prospects and potential long-term growth and it becomes entrenched as political reper repercussions extend the problem. When we make families less, more unequal in our society, then we increase borrowing and we go back to the very problems that caused the global financial downturn in the first place. When incomes keep falling and borrowings are kept at the same rates, eventually households run into <coughs> brick walls. And that's where the Conservative Party are taking the poorest people in our society. In lowering and attacking low-income families, they are putting more people into poverty and in so doing, damaging the future of this country. And why does it matter? No, sorry, I think we're pressed for time. Unequal societies are less functionally capable. They're less socially cohesive. They're less economically sound and they perform worse than the more equal um, countries in our society. This is probably the most pressing growing global economic crisis that we're facing is growing inequality and yet the Tory party fail to realise what their policies are doing in this area. Over half a million children in this country rely on tax credits to make ends meet. 350,000 of those children will feel the impact of the Tory cuts as they strip away much needed tax credits from over 200,000 low income working families. The figures in SPICE show that 197,200 families in Scotland with a total of 346,000 children have been hit by these changes from the Tory party. We have to do something about this. And I wonder what people who are scared about what's going to happen to their futures will think watching this debate this afternoon. Because there should be more that joins us on this than divides us. And we shouldn't be arguing about semantics. We shouldn't be arguing about the principles because we are on the same page on this. The difference is that Order. unlike Labour, this government will not write a blank cheque. It will look for a costed and practical way to tackle the, the policies of this Tory government. No, I'm not taking an intervention. I'm sorry. Um, This decision and who to trust in this issue will lie with the voters. It will come down to who they trust to deliver a commitment to do as much as they can to stop the Tory ideology and create a new system in Scotland. Labour seem to have been more content on a grabbing a headline in this than actually looking at what will be a reasonable and costed manifesto that can go forward for the people of Scotland. And I would say to Labour, they should think very hard on this because people do not have short memories. They do not they forget that in Labour manifestos and promises in the past, they promise things in their manifesto and within weeks, like in the council tax fees, are then saying it's a wrong decision to have carried forward. And let's not forget also that for many of these families, who were already impacted by the abolition of the 10 tax rate, which hit part-time low-income families, and they will not forget that that was Labour's record in delivery. Unlike this government, what this government has done is it has committed £90 million since the introduction of the bedroom tax to fully mitigate that impact, helping over 70,000 people in Scotland. <laughs> With the councils, they've committed over £40 million over, um, helping over half a million people in Scotland to receiving council tax benefit and protected them from the UK government's cuts. Yep. They provided over a million pounds to help combat food poverty in Scotland through the Emergency Food Action Plan 
and an extra £9.2 million of the Scottish Welfare Fund, giving a total of £33 million each for the three years of 2013 and 2016. This is a matter of trust, and I think the people of Scotland are going to trust this government, who have a track record of standing up for the poor, for the vulnerable, and delivering on policies that, unlike the Tories, seek to level our our, our country reduce inequality and as I, have, as I have said I think inequality is the most pressing issue of our times and I'm very very glad to stand behind a costed a, a very Enjoy very close, well please. put together plan from this government to do everything they can to reduce inequality in the future. Thanks so much. Now call on Stuart McMillan to be followed by Hugh Henry. Up to six minutes please. <clears throat> Thank you very much presenting officer. Uh, just before I start, actually, I'm sure that Malcolm Chisholm, a moment ago in his comments, uh, he uh, touched upon the fact that he said that, that, well, that, uh, that the powers that we are going to get uh, to actually deal with this particular situation, but I'm sure that uh, Jackie Bailey in her opening comments actually talk, spoke about the powers that we already have, uh, which uh, I think, the, uh, come back to Malcolm Chisholm's point, uh, uh, highlights once again that, uh, that Labour are all over the place in this particular situation. Uh, signing off, sir, education. Education represents uh, an investment not just in our children, but also in our culture, society, and also our economy. And quality education helps young people be successful learners and grow into confident individuals, responsible citizens, and also effective contributors to society. And a highly skilled population leads to higher wages, better jobs, and economic growth, and benefits the health and well-being of each of us. And yet, a child in poverty is a child that has yet one more barrier to learning. A child whose home life is chaotic or hungry cannot do their best, and a child who worries about the future of their family is a child who is distracted from fulfilling their potential. OK? For that child, why would you prioritise a cut in air, air passenger duty of £250 million? Do you think that was the right choice? And how much interrogation of the possibilities of that tax were, got, went through the Scottish Government before they made that decision, since they can't do one in ta tax credits? Stuart McMillan. Well, thank you very much for the intervention. I will actually reiterate a point I mentioned in this chamber yesterday. I have heard members from the Labour Party speak in this Parliament about the, about the issue of APD, not because it is a bad thing, but because it threatens the airports in the north of England. And I think that is uh, more of an issue that the Labour Party have got to address as compared to anybody else in this side of the House. <clears throat> the main tools for tackling poverty and for tackling the attainment gap lay uh, in the tax and benefits system uh, and also the employment services all need to play their part in a coherent system that delivers for children. It allows parents to work and boosts family income. Currently, unfortunately, these tax and benefits powers are under the control of Westminster. And under the, the Scotland Bill, as it stands, the Scottish Parliament cannot restore all tax credits and does not have the power to reimburse all of those who will be affected. The UK Government uh, is not using these, these tools to tackle poverty or promote work in Scotland, but unfortunately to cut welfare. These Tory tax credit cuts will lead to an immediate uh, £1,500 taken from the pockets of uh, 250,000 Scottish working households next April. Uh, and across Scotland, the number of children affected will be almost 350,000. Uh, and I stay in Inverclyde, and that's 5,500 five children in that one area alone. For anyone who hasn't grasped the scale of these cuts yet, these figures should help them understand just how many families in Scotland are being hit and how many children are going to be affected. And it's time for these powers to be transferred uh, to Scotland, allowing us to take real action to tackle poverty, support working families uh, and to give our children all the support that they need, rather than continuing on the UK Government's course, which will push even more children into poverty. And the SNP today have lodged amendments uh, in Westminster to devolve uh, full working tax credits and child tax credits to the Scottish Parliament. And the amendment uh, to the Scotland Bill that the Cabinet Secretary highlighted in his opening comments will enable the Scottish Parliament to set its own tax credit system, including eligibility, thresholds and tapers, allowing the Scottish Government to determine the level of tax credits in Scotland and to protect households from Tory tax credit cuts. Holyrood should send a united message to George Osborne that these cuts are completely unacceptable and unlike Labour, the SNP have voted against these proposals at every possible opportunity 
and we will continue to do so. And will there any, uh, he's also left the chamber now, but will there any spoke of the, the House of Lords? And unfortunately, with the fatal motion that was down in the House of Lords, Labour sat in their hands. The SNP government have already mitigated some of the worst aspects of the UK government's welfare cuts, and we are already spending £296 million over three years to mitigate the damaging effects of the UK government's welfare cuts. So too will the Scottish government set out clear, credible and costed plans to support low-income households following the comprehensive spending review, and also with the outcome of the amendments that have been laid to the Scotland Bill. I mean, who knows what's going to happen regarding these amendments? But certainly, one thing is clear. That is, this Scottish Government is the one that is credible and it's also competent, something that the Labour Party clearly know very little about. The SNP is standing up uh, for Scotland and Government here in this Scottish Parliament and also we are the only ones who are providing uh, an effective opposition to the Tories at Westminster. Yeah, yeah. We will continue to fight austerity, oppose Trident and aim to ensure that George Osborne's tax credit cuts are stopped in their tracks and for as long as the powers over working age benefits remain in the control in the, in the hands of the likes of Ian Duncan Smith, Scottish families and Scottish children will bear the brunt. We will continue to fight these cuts and demand that the Tories protect the poorest from the worst impacts. And the principal aim of providing support for families is Members to give children the best start in life and the greatest chance to succeed as they grow and develop into adulthood. And it's essential to maintain the highest quality provision in order to support child well-being and development alongside providing significant support to families and sustainable employment opportunities. And that's why I back the amendment in the name of the Cabinet Secretary. Thank you very much. Many thanks. I now call on Hugh Henry to be followed by Joan McAlpine. Tight for time. Up to six minutes, please. Thank you, President Officer. Murdo Fraser took some delight in trying to uh, point out differences of, of opinion within other parties on, on, a, on a range of issues. But actually, on this particular topic, tax credits and the impact that it will have on working families, there's actually quite a significant difference, it would appear, within Murdo Fraser's own party. Because I don't know whether Ruth Davidson represents the caring weekend face of conservatism when she says that she is concerned about the impact that tax credits will cut, whereas Murdo Fraser maybe represents the real face of the Conservative Party in being cheerleaders for tax credit cuts and what impact they will have on families right across the country. And there's a number of different issues at stake here. The, the first issue is, is tax credit cuts themselves and what they will do. Now, there cannot be any doubt whatsoever that there are hundreds of thousands of families throughout the United Kingdom, including here in Scotland, who are profoundly worried about what is going to happen to them. I had the pleasure recently to meet Mark Payne uh, from Port Glasgow, an USDAW member. An USDAW has been a trade union which has been at the forefront of campaigning about the impact uh, of tax credits on, on its members and, and ordinary families. Now, Mark and his partner Agnes live in Port Glasgow. They have three children. They're a family who believe in the ethos of hard work. Both Mark and Agnes work. But they're also a family which stands to lose £2,100 per year because of the changes to tax credit cuts. Mark works full-time as a supermarket delivery driver and Agnes works part-time in the retail uh, trade as well. And what Mark told me, you know, and he said that Agnes and I, we work two jobs for more than 60 hours per week. We've no time with the kids, we've no food in the fridge by the end of the week. And Agnes and I have to skip meals to make sure that the kids eat. Now, when I raised Mark's case with Priti Patel when she came here to meet with members of the Welfare Reform Committee, she agreed to meet with Mark. And I hope that she will listen. And I hope she will reflect on what Mark has to say. Because I do accept that there are members of the Conservative Party at Westminster who have begun to realise the inhumane impact that these tax credit cuts uh, will, will have. But unfortunately and tragically, Mark is not alone. 
There are hundreds of thousands of people like Mark. And it's not just hard-working families. Amanda Batten, the chief executive of the charity Contact a Family, said, these cuts will affect a staggering 150,000 hard-working families with disabled children whose finances are already at breaking point. That's the reality of what we are confronting. Now, I will take help and support from anybody who will help to stop uh, these cuts taking place. And that's why I welcomed the decision in the House of Lords, and, uh, you know, a, a body that has to be reformed and Labour is on record as saying that we will reform that from top to bottom. But what also struck me wasn't just the decision in the House of Lords. The quality of the debate in the House of Lords would actually put this chamber in the House of Commons to shame because we heard some fantastic contributions from people reflecting on what is happening in ordinary families across the country. And to their credit, they forced the Westminster Government to stop and think again. And I hope that that Westminster Government will stop and think again. Now, I agree with Alec Neil. The solution to this is for Westminster to come to its senses and accept that what is being proposed is frankly unacceptable and also cruel in the extreme. But I also do think that we have a responsibility to say that if we cannot win the argument there, then we will look at our power and our budgets to do something. Now, before this afternoon, it was all about whether or not the Labour amendment would have been competent and could have been put into effect. Now, what Alec Neil tells us is that there's an amendment being lodged today in the House of Commons. I don't know whether he's talking about the SNP amendment or the, the government amendment. He seems to indicate that it's that. Well, presiding officer, we have a problem. If that amendment was lodged before the debate today, then we have been asked to vote on an amendment here this afternoon that is outdated, that is no longer competent and is frankly misleading because we have been asked to vote for something that says that we have no power when in, in a minute, when in fact the Minister has indicated that we, we do have or we will have the power. I'll take... In your last 20 seconds, Mr oh, Henry, well, although there appears to be a point of order well, from Mr Neill. This point, uh, what has been lodged in the House of Commons today is a proposed amendment. As things stand, the bill does not give us the powers that would be required to carry out the Labour proposal. If that amendment tabled today is carried, then it would do. So we're not out of order. Many thanks for that. I'll treat that as a point of information. Um, Mr Henry, if you would like to well, close now, please, in the next you 30 know, seconds. The, the amendment says currently no proposed power in the Scotland Bill, and there clearly is. Yeah. Now, I think that we should work together. I think that the Cabinet Secretary should reflect on where they are. Yeah. But, you know, says. this, to be honest, this should not be about point scoring, about who's right and who's wrong. If that power is there, then I think we should grab it with both hands and we should actually reflect. We will look absurd, presiding officer, if we are voting in something that is now outdated. For what another we need day, perhaps, is something Mr. that will actually Henry. protect hard-working families. For another day. Thank you. Meantime, I uh, now call on Joan McAlpine to be followed by Cara Hilton. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. Um, I'd like to open today by um, welcoming the Cabinet Secretary's assurances that we will, um, when the time comes, uh, take measures to help the, the, the families that are affected by these cruel tax cuts. And I have great confidence that he will do that because I judge the Scottish Government by the record, and the Scottish Government spending £300 million already mitigating the damaging effects of UK Government welfare reforms. And it's not, we don't have to just go by the Scottish Government's figures on that. There was evidence presented in March this year to the Welfare Committee of this Parliament, evidence 
commissioned by the committee from Sheffield Hallam University on the cumulative impact of welfare reforms to that date. Um, that did not include the budget shock announcement uh, about the tax credits, but it did include the £350 million uh, of, a, of previous tax credit cuts that were pro brought in by the Tories and their coalition partners. The Sheffield Hallam research showed in March that the cumulative effect in Scotland of all welfare changes announced to date was £1.5 billion, and it, it broke it down into an average of £440 per head for every adult of working age in Scotland, whether or not they claimed benefits. And this is an important point because Professor Steve Fothergill, who conducted the research, pointed out that the per capita cost to Scotland of these welfare cuts was just below the GB average of £450, but it was much less than other areas, including even London, which loses 490 ahead, and the northwest of England, 530, and Wales, 520. And the researcher's explanation of this is worth quoting. The researcher said, it should not escape note, however, that the impact in Scotland would have been around £35 a year per head higher for every adult of working age, if the Scottish Government had not struck a deal with local authorities to avoid passing on the cut in council tax benefit or put in place arrangements to defray the impact of the bedroom tax. It goes on, the financial burden of these welfare reforms is being borne by the public sector budgets in Scotland rather than benefit claimants. So a very clear acknowledgement there from an independent source that the Scottish Government's measures to mitigate cuts are working, but also an acknowledgement that that comes at a cost to other public sector budgets in Scotland. Budgets for health, budgets for education, general local authority budgets that every week Labour come to this chamber demanding more be spent on, even though revenue budgets have been cut by 10% by this Tory government and capital budgets have been cut by 25%. Presiding officer, while I have confidence that this government will, as they have done in the past, continue to do the right thing by the poorest in society, we must recognise that this comes at a cost to the existing public sector budgets and will continue to do so. The Cabinet Secretary has pointed out Labour's black hole. The tax powers will not kick in till one and two years after the cuts to tax credits. And not a single Labour speaker who has been challenged has been able to answer that question about the black hole. Even at that, the Scotland Bill gives us limited powers over tax and welfare. 70% of tax and 85% of welfare will remain with Westminster. So the vast part of Scotland's budget will continue to be determined by the UK government that we didn't vote for and which has very, very different priorities from this government, a UK government that's cutting welfare by £12 billion while cheerily committing to an additional £167 billion for weapons of mass destruction, backed, of course, cheerily by um, our front bencher Jackie Bailey only yesterday. Let's never forget that these cuts are coming from that same Tory government, and it's absolutely vital that we don't let them off the hook. It's vital that we speak with one voice on tax credits, as we spoke with one voice yesterday on Trident Renewal. Uh, George Osborne has been on the ropes over tax credits, so please don't let him bounce back uh, by trying to blame tax credits on the SNP or saying that it's OK because Scotland can some find the money somehow to sort it out and it's not a big deal. It's a very big deal for the families that are affected. And we mustn't let George Osborne off the ropes. We need to talk, call time on his cruel tax credit cuts, and that needs to be done in London Presiding officer, I began by quoting the track record of this government in clearing up Westminster's uh, mess. As well as uh, resources, these measures require expertise at devising solutions that work within our increasingly complex devolved settlement. Um, we mitigating these benefits um, it is difficult, as we have seen. It requires, a, it requires a careful look at what we can do uh, within the powers that are being devolved to us, in which are going to get increasingly complicated with the piecemeal devolution of some benefits and not others. And if I had time, presiding officer, I would quote more of the expert evidence to the Welfare Committee 
on the difficulties that uh, this piecemeal devolution will bring and the real hardship it will cause, uh, particularly the failure to devolve universal credit, Mrs. which George, would make close, mitigating, mitigating these tax credit cuts so much easier. And I cannot understand for the life of me why anyone on the other benches listening to some of that evidence on, uh, on welfare reforms could vote against devolving universal credit in its entirety. Um, I, that's why I, I kind of take with a pinch of salt some of the pronouncements that have been made on the other benches, and I would say to them, it's not too late. Um, there will be amendments put down to the Scotland Must Bill, close, and we can, still, we can still devolve universal credit and indeed power over sanctions, which is another question altogether, which is Thanks harming the much. poorest in our society. Now I call on Cara Hilton to be followed by George Adam. Up to six minutes, please. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. The Tories' austerity agenda is penalising the poor and vulnerable and having a devastating effect on our communities right across Scotland. Over the past five years, we have seen benefits and tax credits changed and cut, hurting working families and the poor hard, while at the same time we have seen taxes cut for the rich and a blind die turned to tax evasion by both individuals and companies. And now, despite promising during the general election to, cut, to protect tax credits, the Tories are at it again. In their election manifesto, the Tories promised to improve the lives of the millions who work hard, raise their families, care for those who need help and who do the right thing. But the changes that the Tories want to make to our tax credit system fly in the face of those very aspirations. I guess the lesson there is never trust a Tory. The Tories' plans to cut tax credits will leave around 4,600 families in my Dunfermline constituency, an average of 1,300 a year worse off. That's more than £100 a month. And across Scotland, more than 250,000 working families will be affected. Across the UK, that figure reaches 3 million. 3 million working families, the vast majority with children, families who are already struggling to get by from week to week, who will have less money in their pockets than they do right now. The Child Poverty Action Group have cited some examples of those affected. The nursery nurse who will lose £1,788 a year. The hospital porter who will lose £2,011 a year. The care worker, £1,906 a year worse off. And while those low-paid families are being made to pay the price of austerity, the Tory governments have made their priorities clear, pledging £2.6 to help the rich by cutting inheritance tax handing £7.25 billion to big business by cutting corporation tax and increasing the take-home earnings of those already comfortable by increasing the threshold for the top rate of tax, benefiting the rich most. Last week in Westminster, Labour Lords won a vote to stop the Tory plans going ahead unless protections are brought in for the most vulnerable. But while the UK Government suffered a setback, the Tories are still refusing to say that they will change their plans. Presiding officer, we've heard many statistics, but I want to talk about the actual impact on families. Short Workers Union, USDA, have been contacting the, their members to find out more about how they'll be affected by the tax credit cuts. Many are already worse off due to previous cuts to tax credits and on household incomes of between 7,000 and 27,000 a year. These are families that are struggling with rising housing costs, heating bills and food prices. In retail, where evening and weekend work is the norm, mums and dads already spent struggling to spend enough quality time with their children, faced with further cuts, are asking if it's worth them staying in work at all. Imagine the outrage if the government proposed a 97 pence tax rate for millionaires. Yet for families in receipt of housing benefit, the increase in the clawback that's been proposed by the Tories means that those families will lose 97 pence of every pound they earn, making it simply impossible to make up for the cuts or to work their way out of poverty, as some Tories suggest. Only a Tory would think the solution is to work more hours. For many families, more hours means more childcare costs, not more income. And for us all work, uh, work members working in retail, the reality is that there's little opportunity to increase their hours at all. In fact, many fear there's a real risk of employers cutting their hours to make up for the increase in the minimum wage. And many uh, worry about being replaced by younger workers that will cost their employers less. So what impact will the tax credit cut have. Hugh Henry mentioned one example, and, and I'll mention another, another example, an Osdo member called David, who could lose £2,000 a year. David has said that the tax credit changes will massively affect his family. He said that they're already worrying about how to pay their bills and how to keep their car running. To quote David, the government is disgusting for taking those tax credits away from people like myself who work hard and have never been employed since they left school. We are the people who are keeping the economy going. And I'll quote again Yvonne from Airdrie, who will lose 1870 a year. 
She says we struggle financially at most months, even without these cuts being introduced. Food shopping is a big part of our monthly budget. Anything over and above is non-existent. This will just make simply if, uh, things worse. Tax credits are an absolute lifeline for these families. They are the difference between keeping their heads above water and going under. These are just two examples which highlight how the Tory tax credit cuts could hit almost a quarter of a million hard-working families right across Scotland unless we act. So no time. Uh, President officer, Scottish Labour will fight these Tory cuts to tax credits every step of the way. We want to protect every family in the UK from these vicious cuts. But should the Tories get their way, we have a, must have a plan B. Scottish Labour have pledged to protect Scottish families from a Tory austerity, and we will. Should the Tories go ahead and implement these cuts, it is only right that we should use the powers of the Scottish Parliament to protect hard-pressed families in Scotland. We can choose to let more children grow up in poverty, or we can choose to do things differently. We will always put those in middle and lower incomes first. We will never put millionaires before work ordinary working people and expect them to pay the price. Members Our plans will ensure that working families are protected and that no one in Scotland will pay more tax than they do today as a result of this commitment. Jackie Bailey has said today that today is a defining moment for Hollywood and she is right. Today it's time to get our priorities right. When children in my constituency are going to school hungry, when families I represent are struggling to afford a food shop, I know what my priority is, and that's protecting the incomes of working families, not reducing the cost of business class flights. Presiding officer, with the new powers agreed for Holyrood, we've got the opportunity to act to ensure that every Scot has got a decent standard of living, to act to ensure that income and wealth is distributed more fairly, to act to end the cycle of poverty which destroys people's life chances. The new powers have been confirmed it's time for the SNP to stop the whinging and to start standing up for working people. Scottish Labour will use the new powers to support working families. The question is, will the SNP and the Tories do the same? The 4,600 families in my constituency who are going to be affected by these cuts to tax credits deserve to know, is the SNP on their side? Many thanks. Can I now call on George Adam to be followed by Christina McKelvey. Up to six minutes, please. Thank you, presiding officer. I'm only too pleased to take part in this debate as it is an issue that shall affect many of my constituents and as always I'll try to represent them in, to the best of my abilities and how we deal with this, these ongoing attacks from the Westminster Tory government is going to continue to be one of our major debates within this chamber. Presiding officer, when I said the savage Tory cuts and tax credits will affect many families in Remshire, I wasn't exaggerating. A recent briefing from children's charity Bernardo's calculated that 10,500 families in Renfrewshire would have to deal with this situation. 10,500 families, presiding officer, half of all families in Renfrewshire who are de with dependent families who currently use this money to buy food, clothes and other essentials. So that's more than 17,000 children in Renfrewshire who will be affected by this callous cut. And all this on the back of the so-called Tory Westminster reforms, where more and more of our constituents, friends and members of our communities will continue to suffer at their, uh, on their uh, watch. The Scottish Government has and will continue to mitigate against these ongoing Westminster attacks. But it's not as simple as the Labour Party are saying. It's not just about tax credit. It's about welfare reform in general. It's about the ongoing attack to the vulnerable within our society. That's what this whole debate about is about. And that's what the Scottish Government is looking at it from a holistic view on how we deal with these issues. And it may be easy for the Labour Party to cart from the sidelines as they do not have to actually deliver for the people of Scotland. But the Scottish Government knows they have a record and will continue to deliver for our people. But I have no doubt that many Labour members have in their heart of hearts. They want to make a difference for their constituents. But it appears they have lost touch with what's happening in the real world. They are debating in the parliamentary bubble when we should be going out there and actually dealing with the issues that affect our constituents. The Scottish Government has and continues to deliver for our people. And uh, who are the public going to believe? Are they going to believe a Scottish Government who has already done that or a discredited Labour Party? Even Labour Party members of high standing are doubting the current policy positions of Labour Party. Tom Harris recently said Labour still expect to be taken seriously as a potential government. Really? He also said Labour has jumped to shark. I give up. That's it for me. Giving up. Goodbye. Now, presiding officer, you're probably asking, this is the question that I asked at the time, is what exactly does jumping the shark mean? 
Well, it's a theatrical term. It's a term for a TV or movie series that has gone on too long and has actually uh, lost any creative input and has no further to go. And it creates a storyline that is so over the top, so unbelievable, that they can no longer be taken seriously. This sounds very, very similar to the Labour Party's current situation. You know, no, I have to carry on at the moment. You know, the actual situation in, uh, uh, we're talking about was when, in happy days, Arthur Fonzarelli water-skied over a shark. Now, I know the Labour Party believes they can do many things, but I don't believe they can actually keep any credibility. So Labour are trying desperately to be relevant to this debate. Yesterday, they were ev being evangelical about scrapping Trident. Or some of them were being evangelical about trap uh, scrapping Trident. Others weren't. Today, it's a cynical attempt to talk about tax credits. This is real people's lives and real people's issues that we are dealing with. And Labour should shop looking towards, I'm looking towards Scotland's future. Labour should join me in doing that and not looking towards tomorrow's newspaper headlines. Yeah, and talking about newspaper headlines, Jerry Mara. Jerry Mara. Thank the member for giving way. If, if I can be allowed uh, to bring the member back to the point of this debate this afternoon, is he in favour of our proposals to reinstate the, uh, the, the, the tax credits for working people in his constituency? George Adam. I'm actually in favour of making sure that we have a policy that can actually make sure that the people of Scotland have the ability to live their life to the full. That's what's important to me, Ms Mara, not sitting here pontificating and making noise when we could be actually doing the job that the Scottish Government currently is. So that is the reason that we have Labour with absolutely no credibility. They've already stated that they would spend the proposed cut in APD on education. No matter how many times Jackie Bailey says they didn't, they already did say they would actually do that, which is their right and a fair point for them to make if they want to do that, because education is an example of being able to bridging the gap in the attainment as a way to bring people out of poverty. But they've already said it, but now they've changed their mind. The other thing that's already been saying, the extra powers are coming in 2017, uh, APD will not happen until 2018. So what's going to happen to these 250,000 families in Scotland in the here and now? How are they going to deal on Labour's kind words? This is about the real world and dealing with the actual issues that are here in front of us, not just playing some kind of political game and debate within the chamber. Presiding officer, these ongoing Westminster attacks are attacks on the weakest in our society, not just families with tax credits, but others and benefits. We have PIP, disability, long-term conditions. Christina McKelvey had a member's debate last week, which I spoke on, and we actually discussed these people who are struggling to get by with this. So for me, it's who do you trust, presiding officer? Do you trust the Scottish Government with an ongoing record that has actually supported the people of Scotland, or do you believe or trust a bunch of chancellors from the Labour Party? Many thanks. Now call on Christina McKelvey to be followed by Neil Bibby. Thank you very much, Presiding Officer. On the, the topic of today's debate, Jackie Bailey talks about value, but she would rather spend £160 billion on bombs instead of burns. So on the topic of today's debate, that's Jackie's way of supporting Scotland's children. Presiding officer, Scotland only gets back about 70% of the extra money we send to London. The other 30% is kept by Westminster. It's usually spent on things we didn't ask for, things we didn't want, like nuclear bombs. The Barnett formula grants Scotland around 30 billion, and, and that's only worth about 28.8 billion when inflation is taken into account. And we have no idea what cut will be given to us by the Chancellor when he hits us at the end of the month. The costs to the UK government's commitment to austerity are increasingly borne by the most vulnerable, with cuts to welfare benefits, not just tax credits, all welfare benefits, that would cost our economy, at least up until now, £4.5 billion. But then, last year, it just got worse. With the Tories' majority came another phalange of cuts, £30 billion in all, heartily, and I remember heartily backed by Labour MPs trooping through the same corridors who are now telling us to mitigate their decision to troop through those corridors. We have little idea what David Mundell's latest proposed amendment does, but we know what our amendments do. We can't ignore the reality that Scotland is not getting any extra money. In fact, a condition of the Smith uh, Commission is neither side would gain nor lose funds. 
So what can we do? Recalculate budget headings. And yes, we did do that to mitigate the bedroom tax, but we cannot keep mitigating Westminster policy decisions on welfare without having the balance and powers of finance and revenue raising. It is ultimately only with full power and full decision-making powers that the Scottish Government will be able to access all of Scotland's resources to deliver a more prosperous and fairer Scotland, including a social security system that works for our people. And unless Labour are, light, are reverting to tight and going to let the Tories off the hook at Westminster for an SNP bad story today. With that reality now straight in everyone's mind, let's see what we could do to mitigate tax credit cuts. Kezia Dugdale says Labour will use new welfare powers in the Scottish Bill. We aren't altogether sure what those will be. And the UK government has just put another 20 amendments or so ahead of us. The latest just at lunchtime today. And Malcolm Chisholm told us that he knew about it last night. Is that that pooling and sharing resources and information that we heard about from Better Together? Because if he heard about it last night, then there was a, sh a straight disrespect to this Scottish government. And the Labour Party cite Clause 21. Discretionary payments would only allow us competence to introduce discretionary top-up payments to people in Scotland who are already entitled to a reserved benefit. And we've already heard what Spice told us today, that that just can't happen. But that does not let us restore or support people sanctioned. It doesn't allow us to restore benefits lost to some 80,000 families or support people who have been sanctioned. The SNP has now lodged amendments at Westminster to devolve full working and child, child tax credits. If agreed, this would allow us complete devolution over tax credits. Can Labour tell me today that their MPs are going to support that amendment? Because if they can't, then it's only empty rhetoric. Colleagues here have made clear their support, and the Cabinet Secretary has also re reiterated the disastrous losses that are going to hit low-income households. And can I congratulate Cara Hilton? She's not here. I wanted to intervene on her to congratulate her, because it was a fantastic speech until the last 30 minutes when she reverted to SNP bad. I agreed with everything she had to say. This Cabinet Secretary has highlighted how we can do that. We've made promises, and we've, we've realised those promises. But all we see for Labour today is an empty promise, a dereliction of their duty to people who need support. And if Labour would like to follow through on their promise that they are making today, then they will trip through the corridors with our MPs next week and, and support the amendments that we have put forward on Monday. But never mind, let's push on. Ms Dugdale will have seen the collection of media reports that described her admirable desire to make things better for those most vulnerable as a wish to restore or cancel or reverse Tory tax credits. I see our spin doctors have been um, spinning away all afternoon trying to change that to top up because they realise they can't restore, they can't cancel and they can't reverse. At the risk of stating the obvious, obvious she seems to have avoided one small issue. Tax credits are not devolved. They are not even counted as a benefit. They're counted as a tax, and we don't know what they will be, nor whether they will be defined as a benefit. The devil is always in the detail, and that's something the Labour Party never take cognizance of. Never take cognizance of. So where is she going to find the money? Is she going to cut the NHS? Minute. Is she going to cut from education? Is she going to cut for local government? Maybe Jackie Bailey will cut the £167 billion she'd rather spend on bombs. But once again, I suppose we are familiar with it now, Labour is making promises they can never fulfil. Labour Party members in Scotland have seen just how true it is when 70% of their close, vote please. do not renew Trident, but the London Party told them you'll do what you're tell. So let's give people a bit of hope. Let's do something for the people of Scotland, support the full devolution of tax credit, not a wishy-washy top-up, just to, to, to support the full devolution Last of tax close, credits please. to the Scotland Bill, and then we can work together to make life better for those people that we all care about. Thanks very much. Now call on Neil Bibby to be followed by Fiona MacLeod. Up to five minutes, please, Mr. Thank you, President Officer. I welcome the opportunity and I'm proud to speak in favour of Scottish Labour's motion today on tax credits. Tax credits have helped millions of families up and down the country since they were introduced by the last Labour government. They were instrumental in lifting over a million children 
out of poverty during the last Labour government by putting money into the pockets of working people. And today they currently support nearly 50,000 families in West Scotland, 350,000 families across Scotland and over 3 million people up and down the UK. I have spoken to literally hundreds of people, including some of my own family members who rely on this vital support. They are so important to so many people. That's why it's scandalous that the Tories now want to take this support away from working families. What is even more scandalous is that David Cameron and the Tories broke their promise to the Scottish and UK public earlier this year. David Cameron told millions of working people during the general election campaign live on national television that he would not cut tax credits and yet he is planning to cut tax credits now. At last week's Prime Minister's questions, we saw Jeremy Cor Corbyn ask the Prime Minister six times whether any working families would be worse off as a result of these changes in April next year, and six times David Cameron did not give a straight answer. However, the questions we are asking today is whether the SNP government and others will join with Kezia Dugdale and Scottish Labour's call to give a clear commitment to help working families in Scotland and by agreeing that, if necessary, we will restore the money lost through tax credit cuts to working families. We know what Nicola Sturgeon has said about tax credit cuts on 25th of June. Uh, she said cuts of that magnitude will have a significant impact on families and poverty levels in this country, and they will push more people into relying on services such as food banks. So, as usual, we have nice warm words from Nicola Sturgeon and Alex Neil today, but working families need more than that. What f working families don't need is excuse after excuse from SNP members who appear keen to find problems and highlight reasons not to act. Because we all know... You, yeah, by all means. Alec Neil. I don't know if the member was in when he heard my speech, but I gave on behalf of the government a very clear commitment. Yeah, Once we know what the ch further changes are that the Chancellor has said he will announce on the 25th of November, we will then look at what gaps need to be filled and we will take whatever action is necessary. That is a sensible thing to do. It's the, the, the detail of Labour's proposals, uh, quite frankly, have not been properly thought out. We need to think out the detail and we need Must to be do brief, the please, Mr. properly Neil. at the right time. Right, Mr. Baby. If you want to give the clear commitment to working families in Scotland, you will withdraw your amendment and support Labour's motion this afternoon. Because we all know you have the power to act. We've been saying it, the Scotland office have been saying it, Spice have said it, and even Alec Neil appears to be saying it this afternoon. We heard it on the, 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 uh, the bedroom tax presiding officer, the SNP saying that we can't act. They actually said legally they couldn't take action to mitigate the bedroom tax until Labour-run Renfrewshire Council showed you how it could be done and Labour in this chamber put it forward uh, as a budget uh, amendment. The bedroom, bedroom tax is actually cited in the SNP amendment, so let's not uh, tell families across Scotland that we cannot take action. Where there is a will, there is a way. The question isn't whether there is a way for the SNP, the question is whether there is the political will. This, as Jackie Bailey said, is a defining day for the Scottish Parliament. Will we decide to exploit the political argument or do the right thing and give people a clear commitment uh, to those who need it? We know and the SNP know that you have the power and you have the resources too. Labour has said we wouldn't abolish air passenger duty costing £250 million in the process. Helping families and stopping children falling into poverty has to be a bigger priority than cutting airline taxes. And if SNP members think the opposite, then you have your priorities all uh, wrong. We can also achieve the resources needed by making different decisions than George Osborne on tax rates without anyone having to pay any more tax than they're currently paying today. We can make this socially just policy work if we have the political will to do so. So there's a number of key questions left. If the SNP want to mitigate the cuts and they, as Claire Adamson said, have a well put together and costed plan, what is it and where is it? And given Alec Neil's comments on having the powers and questions over the competency of the amendment, are they going to withdraw the amendment? And are they actually going to vote against Labour's motion tonight that calls for the firm action to restore the money lost through tax credits? Presiding officer, Scottish Labour has put forward a motion today that can begin the process of supporting working families in Scotland. And I urge all members opposite, if they are serious about doing the same, then to vote for the Labour motion tonight. Thank you. And many thanks to you. I now call on Fiona MacLeod, after which we'll move to the closing speeches. Up to five minutes, please, Ms MacLeod.
Thank you, Presiding Officer. Um, I think this debate has been characterised by a lot of heat and noise, um, especially from one area of the Chamber. And perhaps what we have to do is look at facts. We need to look at facts in a variety of ways. So first, let's test the Tories' actions against the Scottish Government's response. The Tories cut and the Scottish Government mitigates. We don't have the money, but we find it and we do it. So there's the first fact. We have mitigated against the heinous Tory welfare cuts. But then we have to test the Labour Party's proposals against facts. We have to test the Labour Party's proposals against legislative facts, against financial facts and against political facts. The legislation is absolutely clear that in the Scotland Bill there will be a limited devolution of benefits from the United Kingdom to the Scottish Parliament. A limited devolution of benefits. The benefit system only ever works if it's done holistically. We're getting a limited devolution of benefits. Then let's have a look at legislative amendments that down in Westminster we can be supporting or opposing. The SNP laid an amendment to the Scotland Bill to, as Christina McKelvey uh, and Stuart Macmillan talked about, ensure that all tax credits are devolved to this Parliament in their totality. Uh, uh, mm. That we uh, will get the devolution of air passenger duty. Do you prefer to spend that money cutting tickets for businessmen flying to London, or would you rather put it in the pockets of working people? Which one would you prefer? Interesting, Mr Finlay, are you talking about the, the devolution of air passenger duty? That was something, if I remember rightly, that the Labour Party didn't actually want. Um, they, they actually said that it was better to remain with the UK government. Um, and also, Mr. Finlay, that's talking enough. about it holistically, yeah, I want all benefits devolved to this parliament, but I also want the economic levers for us, allow, to, us, allow to, us to make our economy prosperous so that we can then reinvest that back into a socially welfare just Scottish society. So it's about facts, Mr Finlay, not your airy fairy, let's have a go at the, the SNP. And there's another one. Can Mr. I Finlay, like Stuart McMillan can I ask you to and desist? like Christina McKelvey, can I put to the Labour Party next week, will you vote for the SNP amendment to devolve everything to this Parliament? Unlike other SNP amendments that you just don't vote for because they're the SNP, unlike in July this year when 184 out of 232 Labour MPs didn't oppose Tory welfare proposals. Those are the legislative facts that we're looking at. And on the UK government uh, amendment that was lodged today, there's a question I'd like to pose. Will any new Scottish benefits that we produce from this Parliament be immune from a UK clawback th through other benefit changes and other tax changes? And the one that comes to mind for me is free personal and nursing care, something that this Parliament is incredibly proud of. But when we introduced free personal and nursing care, the UK government took away attendance allowance for our old folk in Scotland. So let's make sure that the UK government amendment actually gives us not just the power, but it makes sure that they can interfere with what we do. I'm rapidly running out of time, so you're fine that to talk about um, Labour's you know, way of approaching this financially is just all over the place. Um, politically, Tories, you're beyond words. What you're doing is beyond words, but Labour's words have to be checked against the Scottish Government actions, and many of my colleagues have already been through what we have done to mitigate. In total, £296 million out of a diminished Scottish Government budget over 2013 to 16 to mitigate Tory welfare cuts. But do you know something? The reality is, politically and financially, we can't keep going on mitigating, and we shouldn't have to. It's wrong, it's cruel, and it's deceitful to say that this Scottish Parliament can continue to mitigate the cuts that are coming from Westminster. It's wrong, it's cruel and it's deceitful not to say that if you want to do something about the cuts coming from, from Westminster, but at the same time say that you don't want the powers in this Scottish Parliament to 
benefit our economy so that we can reinvest back in a socially just Scotland. Thank you. Thank you very much. And before we turn to the closing speeches, I want to refer to the point of order raised by James Kelly during this afternoon's debate, which related to the competence of the amendment in the name of Alec Neil. The veracity of any points raised in an amendment is a matter for the member proposing the amendment, not for the presiding officer. Veracity is not an admissibility criterion for an amendment. Therefore, in terms of the standing orders, the amendment in the name of Alec Neil is competent. We will now move to the closing speeches, and I call on Willie Rennie to close on behalf of the Liberals. Six minutes, please, Mr Rennie. Uh, thank you, Deputy President Officer. I think Hugh Henry, in his contribution, uh, spoke about really what it's all about. He spoke about Mark and Agnes. They had two jobs. They were working 60 hours a week. They were struggling to put food on the table. They were struggling to spend time with their kids. Any extra hours spent working was less time with their kids. It's that couple that this debate is all about. You'd find it difficult sometimes to believe that in this chamber that it's connected to that, but Hugh Henry hit the nail on the head. That's exactly what this debate is all about, and that we must do everything we possibly can to exert the influence that we have to make the change that's necessary. Whether it's done here or whether it's done in Westminster, we must do everything we possibly can to help Mark and Agnes, because that couple is what it's all about. I think what we should be trying to do in this country is make work pay. We should be incentivising people into work. And what the Conservatives are proposing, despite their claims of being for working people and in being in favour of work, is they are making benefits pay. It would be better off for some people, if these changes go through, to be on benefits rather than to be in work. That's what the, this whole system was created to do in the first place, just like our tax cuts for those on lower middle incomes. It was about incentivising people into work. So I cannot understand why we're trying to reverse that action. Before we've driven up the wages that we all want to see to that kind of living wage level, the real living wage that we all want to see, before that happens, the cuts are being implemented. So if this chamber really wants to make an impact, let's really focus on what we can do to make the difference. Send the message to the Conservatives at Westminster, just like the House of Lords has done, to actually have a proper programme of change. Yes, by all means, try to put an end to the government subsidising companies who pay their employees low wages. Try and put an end to that. But don't do it on the backs of working people who are struggling to make ends meet. I think to do it in that way, and to present it in terms of trying to balance the budget, only in those terms, I think is unfair. I think Malcolm Chisholm was right as well when he talked about the Conservatives' record on this. Um, it was not in their manifesto, talked about £12 billion of welfare cuts, but tax credit cuts weren't mentioned at all. They didn't argue for it in any of the debates that I heard during the election campaign. And in fact, the Prime Minister explicitly ruled it out as an option ruled it out completely. So on three fronts, the Conservatives have got a record to match on this. And if they believed what they said during the election campaign, they should make meaningful change in the autumn statement. Now, SNP speakers find it difficult to put the referendum behind them. Even when, even when the Minister has admitted today that the power is coming, the backbenchers are still stuck singing an old song, stuck arguing for more powers when we need to focus on how to use the powers that are coming. Christina McKelvey, Joan McAlpine, Stuart McMillan, Fiona McLeod, they all made the case for more powers rather than actually focusing on what Alex Neil says he's now focusing on, which is how deliberate... See, they all get very excited when I start talking about the referendum. Who says we only talk about the referendum? I think the SNP members are the ones that are only interested in more powers rather than actually making this parliament work for working people. But we know the SNP are in trouble when they appeal for unity. 
They appeal for unity. Always unity, though. Always unity on their terms. Never anybody else's terms. Always on their terms. And then, Claire Adamson was brilliant. I have to commend her. Without one scintilla of embarrassment, she called for that unity. And then in the next breath, condemned the Labour Party. Now, how do you seek unity and appeal for unity if you're condemning the people you're trying to seek consensus with? I cannot understand, and, and I'm, I'm impressed by her speaking skills because I didn't think it was possible to do such a thing. George Adam continued that attack, so did Christina McKelvey. But there's someone absent today, um, the, that Presbyterian accountant, the Deputy First Minister, because he said quite clearly just a few weeks ago, not just now, he said a f just a few weeks ago that it was highly unlikely he would reverse the Conservative plan benefit cuts. Highly unlikely. We heard earlier on, no, not just now, we heard about his record in the white paper, the two and a half billion pound cuts that they bellyached for a long time about, but actually didn't do anything about when it came to the white paper. Not one extra penny more than Ian Duncan Smith was planning. Not one penny more, so they'll be judged by the record. So today was the most humiliating day for Alex Neil. Arrived starting off, starting off arguing that he did not have the power and then concluding that he had the power after all, all in the one speech. Now we know the SNP like to say different things to different people, saying whatever they want to hear, but they usually exhibit a certain degree of sophistication when deploying that tool. They usually get different people to say different things to different people. Alex Neil is obviously so confident about his own abilities that he thinks he can say different things to different people all in the one speech. And that's exactly what he did today. And so I commend him, just like Claire please. Adamson, for his speaking ability. But what we need to do is to get back to what Hugh Henry was talking well, about earlier today. on. How are close, we going please. to help Mark and Agnes? That's what it's all about. And that's how this parliament will be judged. Any thanks? Now call on Liz Smith. Up to six minutes, please, Ms. Smith. Uh, thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. I think it's uh, uh, been a very highly charged uh, debate this afternoon. I think the contest for the highest decibel levels are between uh, Mr Neil and Ms Bailey, um, particularly when we were discussing whether the um, amendment was actually admissible or not, to the point that you've now cleared up, Deputy Presiding Officer. But I, I think... Um, Welfare uh, is uh, a contentious and an emotive issue, so it's not surprising that passions have been running high. Indeed, Hugh Henry made an interesting point that he said that he felt that the standard of debate in the House of Lords was very much better than in this place and in the House of Commons. Uh, I, hoped, I hope today, Mr Mackay, that uh, some of that has been redressed, because I think Willie Rennie is right in his opening remarks, where he said that this has actually uh, been a good uh, debate. The Labour motion... Uh, is blunt in its criticism, uh, but can I remind them again of the context that some of their very senior uh, Westminster Labour colleagues said that one of the unintended consequences of Labour Party policy is that we are actually now subsidising lower wages in a way that was never intended. And that's not an argument for scrapping the tax, but an argument for adjusting the system so that wages are in fact driven up. And that's good advice from people like Alistair Darling. It's a clear pointer to the fact that the current high level of tax credits creates long-term pressures on the economy and creates great difficulties for public spending. So Labour cannot get away from the fact that nine out of 10 uh, working families with children uh, became eligible uh, for tax credits because that is not a sustainable situation. Now, notwithstanding the uh, recent differences, very strong differences of opinion between the House of Commons and the House of Lords, because they reflect very much the serious concerns about this issue. And the Scottish Conservatives have been quite clear uh, in their approach that we do have concerns, particularly about the timing of some of these adjustments. And I think it's very important when the autumn statement uh, comes. Yes, of course. I'm confused about if the Conservatives here were quite clear why they sent Annabel Goldie down to the House of Lords to back up the Conservative government. Simple reason that Annabel Goldie put on record on television the other day that it was a point of principle about what the nature of that bill actually was. But that said, those who want to uh, reinstate tax credits to a similar level that they are uh, just now, they have to explain two things. Firstly, how they would actually pay for them and balance the books. 
And secondly, how Britain and obviously Scotland in this case uh, could in those circumstances move to a high wage, low tax economy which pr pr uh, promotes much stronger growth and which will uh, not burden future generations uh, with unimaginable levels of debt. And that's again a point that I think the Labour Party uh, needs to consider uh, very carefully. Because uh, just to pick up the point that uh, Willie Rennie uh, said in his closing speech, the national living wage po policy plus lower taxes plus reform tax credits comes as a, a, a macroeconomic uh, package. It's not, they can't be seen in isolation. So it's our contention on this side of the chamber, given the new powers that are coming to the, uh, this place, that we must reject policies which seek to introduce taxation policies that put Scotland at a competitive disadvantage uh, for exactly the reasons that Murdo Fraser set out in his uh, opening speech. Mark Macdonald said something interesting uh, about the debate being about principle and uh, pract practical uh, issues. I think there is some truth in that, but it's also about choices. And we are clearly uh, going to come to different decisions in the different political parties in this chamber about the different choices. Now, I was a little surprised uh, given an announcement. I, I want at this point, Mr Macdonald, if you don't mind, I was a little surprised, given the announcement from the Scottish Government earlier today, uh, made by Aileen Campbell, uh, about uh, in the, the reason why uh, childcare and educational uh, changes are important. I, I have to say a, a measure that uh, I was interested to hear her making, uh, because I think what she was trying to drive at was some of the issues uh, about better provision in that area. So I was slightly surprised that the SNP members didn't raise some of that, because we're very clear uh, on this side of the chamber that this also has to be part of the equation about looking after uh, Scotland's uh, children. I was interested at the weekend to hear in the Labour Party uh, conference uh, that they uh, are going to introduce uh, 78 million, I think it is, for a fair start fund. And that's to provide extra teaching and extra facilities, as I understand it, for the most deprived pupils. And I have to say that's a laudable aim in principle, if I don't necessarily agree with the way that they're going to pay for it. That what is really interesting about that announcement from the Labour Party is that they're saying that that money is going to follow the child and that the money is going to bypass local authorities and go straight to head teachers. Which party was it that criticised the Tories for doing exactly that? I can point to amendments in the name uh, of Neil Bib Bibby of uh, a speech that uh, Malcolm Chisholm made and Carol Hilton made at times in the past where they have criticised this party for saying exactly that. So if that is a Damascene con conversion from the Labour Party, I very much welcome it because it is a very important part of the package that goes uh, with ensuring that our children have the best start in life. Deputy Presiding Officer, we find ourselves at a very interesting time in Scottish and in uh, British politics. There will have to be difficult choices made. Our party is prepared to make these difficult choices, but also to accept a lot of the criticism that has been levelled in our direction about the timescale for these changes and trying to mitigate it in terms of the poorest. So that's an important thing to think about as we go over the knockabout politics that are very familiar to this chamber. Would there are real course, issues please? here, there are real choices to be made, and naturally I am supporting uh, the amendment in the name of Murdo Fraser. Many thanks. I now call on Margaret Burgess. Up to eight minutes, please, Minister. Okay, thank you, Presiding Officer. And I think in some ways it has been a highly charged debate because it's an issue that is absolutely critically important and it's been highlighted by a number of members. What we're talking about here is low paid people in communities throughout Scotland and we will always seek to protect them. So I'm going to start by being absolutely clear uh, and reiterate what Alec Neil said at the start that we will address these issues, but we will do it by looking to what happens to new claimants, how do we fill the gap between the implementation of tax credit changes and the date from the Parliament has power to fill the gaps. So we will look at this in a measured way once the, the Chancellor has announced what he intends to do with ta tax credits on the 25th of November. But be assured that this Scottish Government will not stand by and let low-paid people in our communities uh, suffer. I'll take an intervention. But Jackie Bailey. I hear what the, the Minister says about looking at the practical implications, but I wonder whether we could establish a principle today. Is it the principle of the SNP government to restore tax credits that have been cut by the Tories in full? 
Okay, the principle just... of the SNP government to ensure that low-paid working families in Scotland do not suffer through the Tory cuts. And that's what we are saying, because we are still... Um, I, I think, if, if you let me go through my speech a bit more, I think Jackie Bailey will actually understand what I'm saying, because they didn't listen to the Cabinet Secretary, so hopefully they might listen to, she might listen to some of what I'm saying, Presiding Officer. If Labour don't want the cuts in tax credits, they should back the SNP amendment to the Scotland Bill that would ensure tax credits were under the control of this Parliament instead of a Chancellor looking to cut £1,500 from a quarter of a million working families in just six months. There was no Labour backing for an SNP amendment, as Joan McAlpine outlined, that would have devolved all working age benefits to the Scottish Parliament in the last report stage of the Scotland Bill. And if the, Labour seem to have now had an about face in realising that tax credits should be in the hands of the Scottish Parliament, and hopefully they can support our, our amendment, and also our amendment which would devolve employment rights and the minimum wage to the Scottish Parliament. I'll take an inter, I want to make some progress and then I will take an intervention uh, later. So these are powers that we can use to lift people's wages and lifestyles and tackle inequalities in our society. And I would also point out to uh, Murdo Fraser and his Tory uh, colleagues that his party didn't go to the last general election with a manifesto commitment on these cuts. And no wonder. They know the results that these punitive measures would have had. And would Ruth Davidson have spoken publicly then to voice her concerns, as Mr Fraser says she's done, or was she kept in the dark like the rest of the voting public? Presiding officer, only a matter of weeks ago, the Cabinet Secretary, uh, Alec Neil, wrote again to the UK Government asking them to think again in tax credits. And I very much hope that the Chancellor and the UK Government will listen to the views of the people of Scotland and beyond. Minister, because point. I'll take an intervention. Hugh point. Henry. Can the Minister confirm, because I was a bit confused by some of the discussion earlier on, can the Minister confirm what the Cabinet Secretary said? that there was a UK Government amendment tabled today in the House of Commons, and that's what he was predicating his argument on? Um, Minister? No, what, what I can say is that today, late on today, we were told the UK Government was tabled, which supports what the Scottish Government has been asking for for some considerable time, to give the Scottish Government power to, to create their own benefits, because under the current... Uh, what the current Scotland Bill currently stands at, we don't have that power. To, we cannot... Uh, we, the, it, there's an amendment that's tabled. It's an amendment. It hasn't... It hasn't been agreed. An amendment has been tabled with other amendments. However, Jackie Bailey didn't seem to know about that. Jackie Bailey was pushing on the fact of the Section uh, 21, which allows this, would have allowed the Scottish Government, when we get the powers, the ability to top up people benefits to people who had an existing entitlement. And that wouldn't have covered people who fell off the the tax credits cliff in April 2016 because they would no longer have had an entitlement and we couldn't have topped that up. So we may have made some progress in that, but I don't think... I mean, I'll go back to that if you want to debate the semantics of it, but what I want to talk... No, what I want to talk Order. about is what we're actually going the to do make in points. tax credits. It's what we're actually trying to do in tax credits and what we are trying to do is protect the people that are losing tax credits across Scotland. And we also will continue to fight the UK government on this because it's something that we, the UK government are creating this for the people of Scotland. We pay into a social security system that we want in Scotland. We want the tax credits to be paid. We wanted the bedroom, to, uh, didn't want the bedroom tax. We didn't elect the Tory government and they're imposing those changes on us and it's right that we try and, and make them see the their error of their ways and not spend their money in nuclear weapons and spend it on social security yeah, uh, helping yeah. the low paid in this country. I won't take an intervention just now. Um, the proposed cuts to tax credits, credits that the Tories are talking about won't be replaced by any rise in the UK government's new national minimum wage, and it's not a living wage, as they would have us believe, nor will it be replaced by any other measures announced in the budgets. It's clear that working families will lose out, and I think Labour and the SNP can absolutely agree in that because of the result of the changes that were pro proposed by the Chancellor. Now, we've been there before in terms of the bedroom tax, 
And I mean, we heard what Jackie Bailey said in the bedroom tax, and we did what we think was the right thing. We opposed it from day one. We constantly opposed the bedroom tax. We tried to get the UK government to change uh, their, their mind on that. We knew we had to, a problem we had to deal with, and we were willing to do that, but we had to find the mechanism, a mechanism that was right, administratively workable, and, was not, and, and that we could cost, and we did that. And the people of Scotland appreciate that. We did that, and we'll do it again. We will always stand up for the vulnerable in our society. So we have got a record of meaningful action, one of re record of credibility and competence. And I have to say to some Labour opponents, it's easy to stand up and say it constantly, speak to your members, you're going to do something. But when you don't have the means or the ideas on how to deliver it uh, and are relying on funds, uh, presiding officer, how long do I have left? Take the intervention. I'll take the intervention. Um, can I thank you very much? Can I, for the record, just correct you that you actually kept people waiting a year, a full year, before you mitigated the bedroom tax? But can I say, can I, can I ask for a point of clarification? Presiding officer, a point of clarification. Alex Neil said earlier that an amendment was tabled by the UK government. He didn't say it would be tabled at the end of the day. He said it was tabled. Would he clarify his comments? Minister. Right. Um, if that, that's just actually taking up some of my time. But I'll go back to bedroom tax. We had meaningful action. We helped 72,000 households with a bedroom tax, 80% of which contain a disabled adult and around 11,000 households with one or more children. The reality is we deliver. So Most let me be very close, clear please. again. The Cabinet Secretary said it. Um, he said it in his speech. He said it in an intervention. I said it at the beginning of my speech. This government will set out clear, credible and costed plans to support low-income households following the comprehensive spending review. That's when we'll know how many families are involved and how much they will lose. Must but I would also us, say, please. in line with what others have said, we shouldn't have to do this. A Tory government that Scotland didn't elect, which is making cuts, uh, are doing it. And the final point I, I would want to make... Oh, you've is, made is your final point, debate. Minister. John that Swinney's will do at the for five today. Task, Thank John you very much. at the five task force next. today. And I now call on Jenny Mara to wind up the debate. Ms Mara, you have until 4.59. Presiding officer, nothing in politics is inevitable. There was nothing inevitable about women getting the vote. There was nothing inevitable about the creation of the National Health Service. Nothing inevitable about the smoking ban passed by this very parliament. They all had to be fought for. People had to campaign for progressive change. And politicians had to be brave enough to make decisions that would upset vested interests. So as we debate the cruel cuts to the tax credits, it's important that we remember that this policy did not just drop out of the sky. Tax credits were not an inevitable change for working families across this country. It took a bold decision by a Labour government and a Scottish Chancellor of the Exchequer to make the changes which have made so much difference to people's lives. Labour was brave enough to redistribute money to those who needed it most. And, presiding officer, we believed and we still believe that children and working families need support in the face of low pay, and we took action to help them. The consequence was a radical overhaul of our tax and welfare system, which put fairness at its heart, and that is reflected in the motion in Jackie Bailey's name today. We did that in the face of the same arguments we hear from the Tories today, but we resisted their empty claims and invested in hard-working families who deserve better than they had under previous Tory governments. And we have heard from the SNP benches that this policy to slash Labour's tax credits will put thousands of children in poverty, thousands presiding officers, 1,700 families in Mark Macdonald's constituency, he said, 18,700 families in central Scotland, according to Claire Adamson, 18,000 families in the west of Scotland, in Stuart Macmillan's region. George Adams said 10,500 
families in Renfrewshire and talked of the 17,000 children that would be affected. And the Cabinet Secretary, Alec Neil himself, said 5,000 families in his own constituency. The SNP really should think hard before they vote against the Labour motion tonight to support these families and reinstate their tax credits with the power that they have. Let me make a little let me make a little progress. I cannot imagine why even a Tory government would find these families and these strivers as fair game for their cuts agenda, but target them they will. They will answer in time for their broken promises, David Cameron's broken promise on tax credits and their cuts to Labour's tax credits. And so, with the changes to the Scotland Bill, Perhaps another thing we can be thankful to Gordon Brown for, the baton, the baton will fall to whichever party the people of Scotland trust to form a government here in Holyrood next May. Scottish Labour and Kezia Dugdale have shown that they are prepared to be bold with a well thought out, fully costed plan to increase the level of tax credits in Scotland to a level that we believe to be fair. And the SNP, they offer families facing deep cuts to their household budgets only excuses after excuse after excuse after excuse. <laughs> Presiding officer, let me tell, take you through some of the excuses we have heard today and I will be happy to take the Minister's intervention. There is not enough time. This is not the right time. We don't know what the spending review will say. We need full powers. Order. We, need, we need full economic levers. We need to redesign the whole benefit system before we do this. We don't have enough power. We don't have enough power. We don't have enough power. Sir. I think the point was she missed what I said when I spoke at the and I said it three times. This Scottish Government will lay out what we will do to help people in low income families that are suffered by the tax credit losses. And I'll make that very clear and I'll say it again. And we will do that based on information and we will find who the people are because quite frankly, if the benefits were devolved, all of tax credits were devolved here, it would actually be an easier job right. for any government Thank to you. do it Jenny if we were in charge of all the benefits. Presiding officer, another list of waffle and excuses. The key point here, Minister, the key point here is the principle. Order. Will the SNP use the power in their hands, the power they already have, support Labour's motion tonight to Order. restore tax credits to families who need them? Presiding officer, the principle here is absolutely clear. Make no mistake. When these powers pass to the Scottish Parliament, when these powers pass to the Scottish Parliament, Mr. they will know... Mr Fitzpatrick. They will no longer be Tory cuts. They will be cuts imposed by whichever party holds the balance of power in this chamber and fails to reinstate tax credits. If Nicola Sturgeon is Scotland's First Minister, they will be the SNP and her cuts. Kezia Dugdale, like Gordon Brown before her, has shown her priorities by pledging to put money in the pockets of hard-working families battling low pay. The member's not taking interventions. Oh, yes, she is. Christina McKelvey. Thank you very much, Ms Mara, for taking my intervention. The only question I have is, will Labour support the SNP amendments to the Scotland Bill to fully devolve tax credits on Monday? Answer, yeah. please. Kenny Mara. The only... Order. The only question the people of Scotland are asking this afternoon is whether the SNP will restore the tax credits. Right, order. Allow Presiding Ms officer. Mara to make her points, please. Kezia Dugdale, like Gordon Brown before her, has shown her priorities by pledging to put money in the pockets of hard-working families. 
Nicola Sturgeon, like George Osborne before her, has chosen to leave hard-working families worse off so she can pursue her own pet projects. For George Osborne, it is inheritance tax breaks. For Nicola Sturgeon, it is tax breaks for the poor airline companies like Ryanair, who just this week announced record profits. Presiding officer, of course, this is not the first time the SNP's record on welfare support has been found wanting. We heard the same excuses when the Tories brought forward the hated bedroom tax. John Swinney told us he would not help families because he did not want to let Minister. the Tories off the hook. It was only when Labour embarrassed them into action that we saw them use the powers at their disposal. And here we are again. First, we were told that the money was not available to re reverse tax credit cuts. When we found the money, we were then told again and again and again this afternoon that the powers do not exist. Forgive me if I am wrong, but it sounds suspiciously like this SNP government is looking for reasons not to take action, rather than using the powers that they have been campaigning for for years to help Scottish families. Presiding she officer, there is a clear matter of principle here. I think it would be remiss, very remiss, of the First Minister and the SNP not to support the principle of Labour's motion this evening. Many thanks. And that concludes the debate on supporting Scotland's children, and it's now time to move on to the next item of business. Point of order. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. I rise to make a pointing, point of order in response to your ruling on my previous point of order in the debate. I contend. Allow Mr. Kelly to be heard, please. I contend that the SNP amendment uh, is not competent in relation to its point about the pearls. Will you allow me to hear Mr. Deputy. Kelly's point of order, please? Am I going to be allowed to make my point of order or are we just going to descend into a rabble? The, the, the SNP amendment is not competent on two points. We've heard from the Minister that amendments have been lodged which give effect to the power, powers in the Scotland Bill to remove tax credits. In addition to that, the clear advice from SPICE states that tax credits can be assumed to be included in the competence offered by Clause 21, allowing, allowing the Scottish Parliament the legislative competence to introduce top-up payments to people in Scotland entitled to reserve benefits. Therefore, on those two, we can have no credibility as a Parliament if we're voting on an amendment which is not competent. And therefore, Deputy Presiding Officer, I call on you to rule the amendment out of order. I thank you, Mr Kelly, for raising a further point of order. However, the accuracy of content of motions is not a matter for the presiding officers. So this is not a point of order. It was not a point of order before, nor is it now, but the point has been made nonetheless. We we'll now move on to the next item of business. And the next item of business is consideration of business motion number 14708 in the name of Joe Fitzpatrick on behalf of the Parliamentary Bureau setting out a business programme. And I would ask any member who wishes to speak against the motion to press the request to speak button now. I now call on Joe Fitzpatrick to move the motion, please. Formally moved. Thank you. As no member has asked to speak against the motion, therefore I'll now put the question to the Chamber. And the question is that motion number 14708, in the name of Joe Fitzpatrick, be agreed to. Are we agreed? Yes. We are. Thank you. The next item of business is consideration of three business motions. I would ask Joe Fitzpatrick, on behalf of the Parliamentary Bureau, to move on block motion numbers 14709, 14710, 14711, setting out timetables for various bills, etc. Minister? Moved on block. Thank you. I propose to ask a single question on these motions. If any member objects to a single question being put, please say so now. 
and as no member has objected to a single question being put, therefore I will now put the questions to the Chamber. And the question is that motion number 14709, 14710, 14711, in the name of Joe Fitzpatrick, be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are. Thank you. The motions are therefore agreed to. The next item of business is consideration of five parliamentary bureau motions. And I would ask Joe Fitzpatrick to move motion number 14695 on committee meetings, motion number 14696 on the designation of a lead committee, and motion numbers 14697, 14705, and 14707 on approval of SSIs. Moved on block. Thank you. And the questions on these motions will be put at decision time, to which we now come. And there are seven questions to be put as a result of today's business. And I wish to remind members that in relation to today's business, if the amendment in the name of Alex Neal is agreed, the amendment in the name of Willie Rennie falls. In addition, if the amendment in the name of Murdoch Fraser is agreed, the amendment in the name of Willie Rennie falls. And the first question is that amendment 14688.3 in the name of Alex Neal, which seeks to amend motion number 146. 8, 8 in the name of Jackie Bailey on supporting Scotland's children be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. Parliament is not agreed, therefore there will be a vote. Members should cast their votes now. Result of the vote on amendment number 14688.3 in the name of Alex Neal is yes, 62, no 48. There were four abstentions and the amendment is therefore agreed. The amendment is agreed to, therefore the amendment in the name of Willie Rennie falls. The next question is that amendment 14688.1 in the name of Murder Fraser, which seeks to amend motion number 14688 in the name of Jackie Bailey, on supporting Scotland's children, be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. The Parliament is not agreed. They will, we will now therefore move to a vote. Please cast your votes now. Result of the vote on amendment number 14688.1 in the name of Murder Fraser is yes, 12, no, 102. There were no abstentions and the amendment is therefore not agreed. The next question is that motion 14688 in the name of Jackie Bailey as amended on supporting Scotland's children be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. Parliament is not agreed. There will be a division. Please cast your votes now. The result of the vote on motion number 14688 in the name of Jackie Bailey as amended is yes, 62, no, 48. There were four abstentions and the motion is therefore, the, mo the motion as amended is therefore agreed. The next question is that motion 14695 in the name of Joe Fitzpatrick on committee meetings be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are. Many thanks. 
The next question is that mo motion number 14696 in the name of Joe Fitzpatrick on the designation of a lead committee be agreed to. Uh, are we all agreed? Yes. Thank you. And the seventh question is, um, and I propose to ask a single question on motion numbers 14697, 14705 and 14707 on approval of SSIs. If any member objects to a single question being put, please say so now. As no member has objected to a single question being put, therefore I now put the question to the Chamber. And the question is that motions number 14697, 14705 and 14707, in the name of Joe Fitzpatrick, on approval of SSIs, be agreed to be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are. Many thanks. And that concludes decision time, and we'll now move to the next item of business, which is members' business. I would ask members to leave the chamber quickly and quietly.